Hello, son. Before the show starts, I just want to give big thanks to our members, Donald Baker and Brad79. They support our family throughout the membership, and I really am thankful for their support. In any case, tonight we'll continue our horror story saga with a few hours of perfectly picked scary stories. Let's go. So today, my friend, let's call her Ray, and I were in my car at night, windows rolled down and screaming our heads off to loud music. We were feeling absolutely happy, laughing and having a great time overall while driving around the rich neighborhoods looking at huge mansions. Now, here comes what spooked us majorly. We start getting a little put off because of how dark this road was. Plus, we were going into the middle of a forested area, and everything around us was getting darker and darker. I had to turn on the bright on my car. Now, we still didn't say anything to each other seriously, only joking about being a little nervous and getting weird vibes. I make the mistake of turning down a forked road, and immediately we feel sick to our stomachs, both at the same time. I just looked at her, and we both started saying about how something is not right. It was such an urgent feeling of terror, dread, knowing something terrible was going to happen if we stopped the car. We felt like we had to roll the windows up because we wanted to be safer. Once we finally sped back around and started leaving, I felt an intense feeling of something watching us, and I just could not make myself turn to look to my side into the forest or behind us. The second we got off that road, it felt like a weight came off our shoulders again at the same time. I've never felt this terrified before, with such a huge pit in my stomach and sense of dread. What was that? Seriously, I have no idea what happened or why we started feeling that way suddenly. I'm so scared even just thinking about it gives me goosebumps all over. Has anyone else experienced something like this, or do you know what it might have been? Get it. Sorry for my lack of education on what Wendigos or other creatures of that sort actually are. I heard from people around me that that's the feeling you get when they are around you, but I might be totally wrong. Something was definitely up, though, whatever it was. My name is Dakota, and I am a Native American, member of the Ojibwe tribe. I grew up on the reservation surrounded by the dense forests of the North Woods, but the woods were never as terrifying as the night I had an encounter with an unknown predator. It was a chilly autumn evening, and I was walking home after a long day of fishing. I had just reached the edge of the woods when I heard a strange sound behind me. I turned around to see a creature like nothing I had ever seen before. It was tall and thin, with glowing eyes and a mouth full of razor-sharp teeth. Its fur was matted and covered in dirt, and its breath smelled of death. I tried to run, but the creature was too fast. It chased me through the woods, its footsteps pounding the ground like thunder. I could feel its hot breath on the back of my neck, and I knew that I was about to be torn apart. Somehow I managed to stumble back to my camp. My tribe could see the fear in my eyes, and they knew that something was wrong. I told them about the creature I'd seen, and they listened intently. It was then that I learned the truth. This was not the first time our tribe had encountered the predator. Over the years, there had been many sightings of the creature in the woods. Some claimed it was a wendigo, while others thought it was something even more sinister. Our tribe had always tried to find the predator, but it always seemed to elude us. As I recovered from my encounter, I began to research the predator. I discovered that it was not a natural creature. It was the result of a government experiment gone wrong. The predator had been created in a lab using a combination of science and magic. Now, I am on a mission to find the predator and put an end to its reign of terror. I am not alone in my quest. My tribe has joined forces with other native communities to take down the predator once and for all. We know that this will not be an easy task, but we are determined to protect our people from the unknown predator that lurks in the deep woods. As we traveled deeper into the forest, I could feel the weight of the unknown pressing down on me. 
Our weapons felt inadequate against this creature, whatever it may be. Suddenly we heard a sound that could only be described as inhuman, and we knew it was close. We readied our weapons and waited, but the predator never appeared. We searched for hours, but found nothing. It was like the creature had vanished into thin air. As we returned to our camp, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to this than just a simple predator. There was something strange in the air, a feeling of unease and fear that seemed to emanate from the very forest itself. It wasn't until we returned to our tribe and shared our story that we learned the truth. The government had been conducting experiments in the forest trying to harness the power of the supernatural for their own gain. They had unleashed a force they couldn't control and now it roamed free in the forest. It was a being of magic and darkness, a creature that was beyond our understanding. We knew that we had to act fast if we were to stop it before it destroyed everything we held dear. The next day, we set out once more, this time armed with knowledge and determination. We knew that we were up against something far greater than ourselves, but we also knew that we could not back down. We traveled deeper into the heart of the forest, guided by the magic of our ancestors, and finally we found it. The creature stood before us, a being of pure darkness, a force of nature that defied all explanation. We fought with all our might, our weapons clashing against its inhuman form, but it was like fighting a shadow. It moved too fast, too fluidly, and we couldn't keep up. It was only through the power of our magic that we were finally able to drive it back, to send it back to whatever dark realm it had come from. We returned to our tribe, battered and bruised, but victorious. Knowing that we had protected our land and our people from a force that was beyond our comprehension, and even as we celebrated, I knew that the forest would never be the same again, that the echoes of the unknown predator would haunt us for years to come. This happened when I was seven years old. I'm sharing this because my older brother reminded me of it now that I'm 24 and now I can't get it out of my head. This was very traumatic for me because after this event, a bunch of other things started to happen. This is how it started, growing up, and now I live in a haunted state, and I live five miles away from the most victorious haunted forest. My mom used to tell my brothers and I about what she would hear walking by the forest, the murders that happened, and about how she used to see Pukwudgies. My older brother, 11 at the time, let's call him Dan, and, a, and I, 7 female, were watching TV in the living room, it was dark outside. Must have been a new moon. If you were sitting on the couch and looked to your right, you would see the glass sliding door, which viewed the backyard. Mind you, it was an acre long, and tall trees lined the perimeter. I was tired and decided to get my ritual glass of milk before bed when I stood up and saw what was glaring at me through the glass door. It was tall, taller than the F door. It was skinny in the torso but its chest was broad. It was white with tall ears. I want to say it looked like the white version of Donnie Darko. I was about 15 feet from the glass door. I froze. It didn't move. It just kept looking at me. It could not have been anyone else, because we lived in the middle of the woods. I start calling for my brother's name, but Dan wasn't answering me. I started to get louder, now calling for my mom. Her room was on the other side of the couch, so she was there in a heartbeat. She looked at the back door, looked at Dan, then told me to just sit back down. I couldn't understand why I was the only one freaking the F out. I laid on the couch, facing away from the glass door. Dan puts a blanket on me, and we both fell asleep on the couch. Well, 2020. One, Dan calls me from jail. He's been in and out since I was 13. This is how the conversation went. Dan, hey, can I ask you something? Me, what's up, Dan? Do you remember that night? Me, what night, Dan? That night where you were freaking out? We were young. Remember that tall, scary-looking thing that was at the back door? Me, I had a flashback of that night. Dan, look, I had a dream about it last night, and I wanted to tell you that I saw it too. I was too scared to do anything. Mom saw it also. 
The convo ended because he only had so much time on the phone. I felt relief that I knew I wasn't just having a schizophrenic hallucination episode, but my body went numb from the memory of being so scared. I told my soulmate about it. He's my best friend. My friend told me that I came face to face with a Wendigo, and how he wasn't be surprised because of the small country town I lived in. When I looked up what a Wendigo was, my heart sank. That's what I saw. Now, I think about it every day. It's been a year since I was reminded of it. I believe it still follows me. I wanted to share something I experienced in 2018, which, after reading some of the descriptions here, made me think posting would be a good idea. Maybe someone can comment on whether this fits the profile or not. This happened in Urbana, Illinois during spring 2018, around 8 p.m. I was driving an SUV through a residential area, 30 miles per hour, with moderate street lighting. I was coming back home from grocery shopping and turned a corner into the usual street. After driving one block, I saw something similar to a large white silver dog figure suddenly run towards the right front wheel of my vehicle. I gouged its size to be substantially larger than that of a German Shepherd with an unusually bright hide. I braked quickly in fear of having run over it. Within seconds, I got off the car and performed a quick check. No signs of any injured animal, no nearby rustling into an unkempt garden next to where it all happened, no animal crossing the road. This took less than five seconds. Then I paused and saw the same figure two blocks away from where I was, looking at me intensely for about 30 seconds. I looked back to the tire in my vehicle an instant, and it was suddenly gone when I checked again. All happened in less than a minute. After this, I drove around several blocks without signs of any dog or similar animal nearby for about 10 minutes. Estimating the distance in time between events, I am certain that it is not feasible for a dog, much less such a large one, to run that quickly that distance, particularly without seeing it under street lighting. Comments are welcome. So this happened last year, and almost every year I go to Palatka and go to a place called the Badlands. It's a giant tree farm that his family owns, but in general it's in the woods. So one day we were hanging at the Angel Tree, which is just a nice, giant, beautiful tree. And we heard a turkey because it's the wild, so my friend Andrew made the joke of saying how you never know when you'll have to shank a turkey. Either way, we went to go check it out after we got like five feet under the trail. The noises from the turkey stop. Then I hear it to my left while Andrew heard it to his right. We hear footstep now. Of course, you could said how there's deer and other wild like which there is. But it sounded like human footsteps, like you know the distinct noise of bare feet. That's what it sounded like. The second we heard that we ran to the ATV and went back to the house. I looked up if there's Navajo grounds in Florida, and I kind of found something, I think, but the articles were all over the place. Ever since then, we haven't heard it again since, but we don't feel that safe going out in those woods anymore, especially at night. Now again, I know this is a Skinwalker subreddit, but I don't know if this was a Skinwalker or a Wendigo. This is kind of a long story. I'm going to try and keep it as short as possible. I just recently moved to Oklahoma. Recently, I keep having very uncomfortable experiences outside, especially in the evening or nighttime. It started when I went to go put laundry in the wash one day. We have a laundry room attached to our building, and it was broad daylight, so I wasn't exactly feeling nervous about anything. I got about 20 feet from the walkway or alleyway to the washroom, and I smelled the worst rotting animal smell I've ever smelled in my life. Not only that, as soon as I smelled it, I got the strongest flight or fight reaction I've ever felt. I ran back to my unit, locked the door, and had a small anxiety attack. I waited about 15-20 minutes before going back out, and when I did, there was no smell, and I felt normal. Fast forward about a week later, 
My husband and I were outside at about 1 a.m. smoking a cigarette when we heard what sounded like a dying dog. We live right off of a major interstate, so we assumed an animal must have been hit. We started walking towards the direction of this noise, sort of a wheezing whine, a terribly sad noise when we got to the edge of our parking lot. As we got onto the pavement, the wheezing dog noise turned into what sounded like an owl hooting. I understand owls make strange noises. I was raised in Texas. I've heard many, but this was not an owl. The longer we listened to it, the more it sounded like a person trying to mimic an owl. My husband called out, hey, is someone there, pretty loudly, and just silence was the response. We stood quiet a few moments before the owl noise completely stopped, and the sound of an unnatural laugh echoed from the trees. The only way I can describe this noise is it was like when a deaf person laughs, like they can't hear how they sound, so it just kind of sounds a bit off. I don't mean to sound rude at all, truly. That's just the only way I know how to describe it. It felt like ice water was in my veins as soon as I heard it. Both of us just felt extreme fear in that moment and ran back to the house. I could explain off all of these things if I hadn't seen what I'd seen next. A few days later, I was outside smoking around 7 p.m., and I saw two men walking on the side of the street where I'd heard the noise a few nights prior. They walked past the trees a little ways, but then stopped. It was dusk, so light was low. One of them turned on their phone light and shined it into the trees before jumping back. Both men took off at a full sprint away from the tree line. I have no idea what they saw. I didn't hear anything. But there was pure fear there. The most frustrating part was I was looking right at them and saw absolutely nothing. Fast forward about a week later. I get a text while I'm at work from my husband telling me he heard our daughter talking and laughing in the field across the street. He was 100% sure it was her and until he realized she was inside in her room. He said it sounded just like her. Fast forward again a few days later. I found dried blood on my door jam, as well as scratches near my doorknob and more dried blood at the bottom of my door. My neighbor had their internet cables cut and told me that someone had tried to open their door the night it happened and then slammed their body against the door trying to break in. My neighbor said he forced himself out the door ready to confront whoever was there. But there was no one. We constantly hear things on the roof, things in the alley behind our place. Our dog will run to the door at random hours and sniff and growl like someone is there. I have probably made a mistake by calling out to this thing, whistling at night, trying to antagonize it, because I desperately want a recording. I have one recording of its noises. It sounds like an owl, but towards the end, there's this low, inexplicable moan that comes from the same place the owl sounds are coming from. It's hard to hear and ends very abruptly. I don't feel like this is good enough. No one believes me, but something is out there. It knows I know it. I feel it watching me if I curse at it or try and lure it out. It goes completely silent or does that horrible laugh. I can never seem to catch the laugh or any of the noises as soon as I hit record it usually stops. I don't know how to explain this but I know I'm not crazy. Please, if, if someone can help me, I really want to know what this thing is. I have pictures of the blood on my door the scratches and the video of the owl sounds moan. I just feel like no one will take this seriously. It always smells like a corpse when it's around. That's the biggest sign something isn't right. I brought it up to one of my native co-workers and he said leave it be. Wash the blood from your door and stop trying to talk to it. He wouldn't tell me anything else. I don't know if this is a wendigo, a skinwalker, or something else entirely, but I have never felt such dread and fear as I do when I hear or smell it out there. Please, someone. Anyone, if you know what this is, please tell me I'm not losing my mind, and if it's real, how do I make it go away? This thing is causing me so much stress. Thank you for reading. Edit. Thank you to everyone who took the time to share advice and thoughts on this. To those who are concerned about me putting myself in danger, thank you, and I'm inclined to agree with you all, but understand I'm still not sure if this is just a weird animal I'm hearing and nothing paranormal at all.
I will be avoiding it from this point forward, just in case it is something that wants to eat my face. I will, however, update this post if anything else worth mentioning happens. Thanks again. I'm Jackie, a park ranger at Shenandoah National Park in Virginia. I love my job, but I never expected to have the experience that I did on a dark and stormy night in the park. I was driving down a deserted road checking on the park's campsites when I saw something that made me slam on the brakes. A massive creature was standing in the middle of the road. It was a bipedal brown Bigfoot and it was staring at me with its glowing red eyes. I tried to back up but my car was stuck in the mud. The creature started moving towards me and I knew I was in trouble. I fumbled with my radio trying to call for backup but the signal was weak in the mountains. The creature bared its teeth, and I could feel the car shaking as it approached. I thought for sure that it was going to flip the car and attack me. But then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, the creature turned and ran off into the forest. I sat there shaking and trying to catch my breath, wondering what had just happened. Over the next few days, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I heard strange noises and saw shadows moving in the trees. I knew that the creature was still out there somewhere in the forest, and I was never sure when it would make its presence known again. I tried to keep my encounter a secret, but rumors started to spread. People started coming to the park hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature. Some even brought guns hoping to hunt it down. But I knew that the creature was dangerous, and that it was best left alone. I continued to work at the park, but I never forgot about that fateful night when I came face to face with a bipedal brown creature. My friend first came across the prints while walking through the sage hunting rabbits. It's a high desert area with no visible trees for miles. It is 15 plus miles to nearest residence which is the Simplot Cattle Ranch. We observed several large tracks made by one creature. The track had a very large big toe and three other toes on each foot. We did not backtrack but followed the prints for several yards. We then went back to hunting. The tracks continued on. I guess my encounter is about something called the Glimmer Man. I'm from southern Ontario, Canada. It was been mid-July 2018. My boyfriend and I were spending a day in Toronto at a few restaurants, had a couple of drinks throughout the day, and then decided to kind of head back to the hotel early and crash. I woke up at about 5 a.m. or so. I do wake up fairly early, but not this early. I was trying to go back to sleep. It happened that there was some light from dawn coming in from the windows. The curtains were drawn in the hotel room, but there was some light coming in. I noticed that I can hear it. It was my boyfriend talking in his sleep. I looked over at him. I guess there was probably about three feet of space between where my boyfriend was lying on his side of the bed and the space between the wall. As I looked beyond my boyfriend, I saw a shimmering movement along the wall. As I continued to watch, I distinctly made out a humanoid form. It was kind of rocking back and forth. I didn't know what to think. Maybe I was tired and imagining this. Then I saw a pair of eyes manifesting on the face of this being. As I watched the eyes turned a bright yellow color. Then the being crouched down and out of sight. Then suddenly it popped up right beside my boyfriend. I saw a shimmering hand reach up and cover my boyfriend's face, then pull back when my boyfriend made a gasping sound. Then it happened again. I started shaking my boyfriend, but he wouldn't wake up. The being then stood up and started walking around the bed toward my side. I immediately jumped out of bed and headed toward the bathroom. I entered and slammed the door. I yelled for my boyfriend to wake up, but I heard no response. Then I heard him gasping again. I opened the door and saw the being lying on my side of the bed. I stood and watched it, again yelling at my boyfriend to wake up. Then suddenly my boyfriend woke up and lets out a horrific scream. He looks at me with wide, terrified eyes. I looked over to my side of the bed. The being was gone. My boyfriend tells me that he had an awful dream that someone was trying to smother him. I started crying. 
I told him what I'd seen. At first, I don't think he believed me. But the more I talked, the more he realized that his dream was similar to what I was describing. We quickly packed our bags, checked out early, and then drove home. Since that day, my boyfriend and I married. We bought a house and planned to start a family soon. But I occasionally see the same glimmer man. I believe he hitched a ride back with us from Toronto. He isn't here all the time, but seems to show up at the most inopportune times. Can you tell me what to do? Can this being be removed? Is it a spirit or a malevolent entity? I live in Evanston, Illinois, just north of Chicago. I was asked by my mother's friend to move some stuff to a storage unit nearby. I had not been working because of pandemic, and the pay was decent, so I went ahead and agreed. It was raining all day off and on, but at times it got so heavy that I couldn't transfer boxes from my car to the unit. So I just get comfortable inside the unit and listen to some music while I wait for the rain to clear up. It's cozy in there, to be honest, and the rain just keeps getting worse. It's not very cold out, though. I'm just chilling when I start hearing this banging noise from nearby. It sounds like something hitting metal at first. I think that maybe there was a car accident on the nearby highway, Lincoln Ave, Highway 41. But then I realized it was coming from the other direction, and I really don't want to go outside and get wet. I tell myself that someone probably dropped something like nothing serious, but I continue hearing various banging noises. I still didn't bother checking, but as it continues I decided to check it out since the rain had let up a bit. I walk outside and turn the corner and see this massive hole in the fence, leading to a little wooded area at the North Shore Channel Trail. I see this white thing moving near and under the dumpster by the fence. I'm thinking that it was a large white garbage trash bag, but it just doesn't look right. I'm confused and I'm trying to get like a closer look at a thing. I may be about 100 feet or so away from it. I see something sticking out of it and it's making a clicking sound. I say hello. Who's that? I immediately regret yelling this out. Something big squeezes out from underneath the dumpster. It looks like a pile of fleshy tissue with spike-like protrusions. It stands four feet tall, but then it extends up to over six feet. It looks like a humanoid spider or other insect, but with white flesh. It doesn't have an exoskeleton, just smooth white flesh. The head is weird, kind of insect, like with no mouth that I could see. The eyes were human, like and had a reddish glow. It had long slits along the side of its head. It stood there clicking and watching me. I could sense that it didn't want me there. I was wondering why I was still there and hadn't run off. But I was frozen in place and terrified. I had heard about the Chicago Mothman and was wondering if this may have been it. But it didn't resemble anything that I had ever heard about. Then I felt a sudden rush of calm come over me and I was able to break the trance I was in. I hauled ass back to the storage unit, locked it up, got into my car and quickly left. When I looked back in the direction of the creature, it was gone. I returned the next day and finished unloading the boxes from the car as fast as I could. This happened in the spring of 2020. I haven't told anyone about this. All right, so let me first begin by telling my place. I am from northeast of India, very quiet and lovely, full of nature and very distant from the eccentric part of India, and the creature in my story is called Kibyukaiba. In my tribe's language, it means half man, half tiger, or like man, like tiger, to be precise. Quite similar to the skinwalker, eh? Anyway, my tribe is actually the Mitei tribe of the state of Manipur. There are several states in the northeastern India with multiple tribes in each state. They might or might not have this mythological creature in their folklore, but this story is one of the famous one in our tribe, among others. The exact famous one is about the story about this creature, Kebu Kaiba with the seven brothers, one sister. If you guys want to hear this story, let me know in the comments. 
I'd be happy to share the story, or in fact share you an animated YouTube video about the said story some guy from our state created. It's exactly how it has been told to us when we were kids. And it's very eerily similar to the Navajo legend, although the creature in our story is just one guy creature, instead multiple creatures, who was a famous medicine man, or Oja, who discovered he could conjure some dark magic to convert himself to a tiger or this vile animal and could convert back to his human form. Also, I've heard I don't know if it's true, but people in Thailand, Myanmari and few other Southeast Asian countries apparently knows about this story, but in their own different twist. But it does make sense, cause in our story, it ends with a creature running away, chased away to the south of our state, and it's quite likely it found a new home in those countries. But now that I know that skinwalkers in the West existed or exists, well debatable by most I guess, I think my story now gives a whole new perspective to its existence and its widespread activity it had around the world. Or it's a common dark magic among the planet's witch and witch's world. I've been working as a police officer in Detroit for a little more than a decade now. I've learned that ghosts are not the scariest thing you'll find out there. Living people are far worse. However, one of my first scary experiences did involve something paranormal. It still roams around my mind. I was still a rookie back then going out for my first night patrols. I was nervous, but also excited to get the chance to finally take matters into my own hands to make the country a safer place and play my part. Yes, I was the classic naive kid with big dreams. I believe that becoming a cop was the closest thing to a superhero. I know better now. So anyway, I was sitting there next to my partner in the car, driving around the neighborhood patrolling. It was starting to get very late, around 11.35 p.m. We had seen nothing suspicious or out of the ordinary, so we're getting kind of bored. We parked in sort of a desolate part of the neighborhood just watching the hours go by, and our radio flicked on. We were being dispatched to another place as somebody had reported strange noises coming from an abandoned warehouse. My partner seemed more annoyed. I was ecstatic. Finally, something to do. I was so afraid I would get nothing to do on one of my first nights out. I was willing to check out every corner of that warehouse, even if the noise just turned to be a family of raccoons, so we said to check out what the ruckus might be. We drove deep into the neighborhood. You know how in Detroit there are some places that were basically just left to rot. Well, the warehouse was located in one of those empty spots. Every house for miles seemed to be in a progressive state of decay. We began wondering who would have reported a noise disturbance in such a place. Nobody seemed to be living near. We got to the place and parked the car. The warehouse was basically just a run-down, barely standing building. The roof was missing in some parts. Most of the windows were just charred, and the walls were blackened almost all around. The doors were so rusty it seemed that they would become dust the moment we tried to open them. But that was not the only thing. The place had a vibe. I don't know how to describe it. It felt like a place you should stay away from. Both my partner and I knew it. He looked at me after taking a look at the building, suggested we both claim we found nothing inside to get out. I felt very tempted, but I needed to know I could handle this job and be a proper officer. It was time to improve myself, so I refused his offer and told him we should just give a quick look around in case something might be going on inside. He rolled his eyes at me, but reluctantly agreed. We got our guns, flashlights ready, getting out of the car. I immediately noticed the heat. It was an early fall night, so it wasn't exactly cold. However, when we stepped out of the car, I swear the temperature had risen like 20 degrees. I had to leave my jacket in the car. My partner just took this as another bad sign and insisted on leaving. He was also the very superstitious kind. I needed to just take a look around and felt like I truly done my job. We approached the factory and the temperature was just soaring the closer we got to it like it was a furnace. I now started to sweat. It felt almost like the heat was coming from the building itself. 
We got to one of the doors. I tried to grab the handle to pry it open. The moment I touched it, the metal felt burning hot. I cursed immediately, removing my hand. I looked at the handle, and even though it felt like it was red hot, it seemed completely normal. It left faint burning marks all over my hand, and my partner and I were beginning to freak out. He once again repeated, we should just leave the place and call the fire department. We turned around and were about to head back when we had heard the screams and the pounding. In the blink of an eye, every door and wall was being desperately pounded by what must have been dozens of people, and all sorts of screams and wailings were coming from inside. My partner and I bolted straight to the car, but Ben Way, my hero complex, kicked in completely idiotic. I headed straight back to one of the window openings. As I approached again, the screams got louder, the heat it being almost unbearable. I could feel my eyelashes getting seen. As soon as I got close enough, I looked inside, expecting to find somebody, something that could be making and responsible for all the noise. The building was empty, just a run-down warehouse, with their floors covered in black and rubble. I got a really bad feeling in the pit of my stomach, so I bolted out without even looking back. I got inside the car where my partner was very patiently waiting for me. We drove away very quickly as we got out, and my heartbeat finally slowed. Those voices, they still resonated in my head. They were screaming in pain, pleading for help, and of course nobody took us seriously at all back at the station. Even the fire department got incredibly annoyed when they found nothing. They were sure somebody was playing a prank, and they were not fans of pranks, especially when it involved them wasting their time. But from then on, I was very weary of night patrols, even more so when they involved desolated places, all dilapidated buildings where gangs and criminals would go to. Hang out. After this, I never came across something like that afterwards. To be fair, I have not been to that part of the city ever since that night. I have done some research, though, and turns out around 50 years ago, the place was actually a textile factory that burned to the ground in a very uncontrollable fire, a massive conflagration. A lot of people, unfortunately, did not make it out. The factory was then rebuilt from the ground up not too long after. I'm sorry, I don't know the dates. I believe the screams we had heard were from the ghosts that were left behind, scars left by the tragic events. I still don't know if that's really what it was, but whatever it was terrified me and makes me feel very sad about all of it. As a park ranger named Zane, I've had the privilege of working in this park for years, and it never ceases to amaze me with its natural beauty. The park is a mix of rolling hills, dense forests, and meandering streams. There are fields of wildflowers, hidden waterfalls, and towering cliffs that offer stunning vistas of the valley below. It's a peaceful place, and one that is beloved by hikers, bikers, and nature lovers alike. But one night, everything changed. I was doing my rounds, checking the trails and campsites when I heard a strange noise. It was a low growl, deep and guttural, coming from somewhere in the woods. I shone my flashlight around, but couldn't see anything in the darkness. That's when I heard a loud snap and turned to see a massive creature standing before me. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen before, with long, shaggy fur and glowing eyes that seemed to pierce through the darkness. The creature was huge, standing over eight feet tall on its two hind legs, and it had the strength of ten men. I tried to back away slowly, but the creature took a step forward, blocking my path. It bared its teeth, growling menacingly. I knew that if it wanted to, it could easily overpower me. I was frozen with fear, stuck in place with nowhere to go. The creature let out a deafening roar, and I knew that I had to act fast. I drew my taser and fired, hoping to stun the creature and buy myself some time. But to my horror, the taser had no effect. The creature simply shook off the electric shock and continued to advance. I knew that I had to get out of there and fast. I turned and ran as fast as I could, my heart pounding in my chest. I could hear the creature chasing after me, its massive footsteps echoing through the woods. 
Somehow, I made it back to my ranger station alive, but I knew that I had encountered something truly terrifying, something that I couldn't explain. The creature was unlike anything I had ever seen, and I knew that it was out there, somewhere in the woods, waiting for its next victim. My stepdad lived in Virginia when he was around the age of eight, right on the edge of the great dismal swamp. According to him, he was in bed one night when the sky was cloudless or just very bright. He never thought until recently whether the moon was shining or not, and saw a beast looking right through his window at him. He said he could see spittle running down its face and its eyes were looking straight at him. It was supposedly standing on its hind legs and had cream, red, and brown-colored matted fur and a face almost like a wolf. Other than its snout, its facial features were very human. Its jawbones were high, the structure around its eyes and its eyes themselves were human-esque. The coloring of its eyes, he believes, were yellow. The reason why I think this is interesting and possibly valid is because the Great Dismal Swamp covers a huge amount of territory and is hardly touched by humans. Only in recent years have people started to study its inhabitants. The grounds are wet, mossy, and absorb sound, and people have been known to wander into it and never return. Who knows what could be lurking in the unknown? Chills my bones. Oh, yeah. I forgot to mention that he crawled out of his bed and went straight to his mother's room. In the morning, when they looked around the house, all the windows had ground that was stirred up under them and grass that was yanked out. There were actual scratches in the wood under his window, and paint was missing too. However, as far as they could see, there were no discernible footprints. The following is my story of my encounter with what I believe to be some unknown predator. This story is 100% true and not a work of fiction. I have no idea what I encountered, but I believe it was some animal unknown to science currently. This was in the late 2000s in Helmand Province, southern Afghanistan. Late summer, around four or five months into our tour. A mission we were supposed to deploy on was changed the day before due to an operational incident, and it was completely changed. So I find the odds of a security leak incredibly unlikely. We were dropped off at the far end of a mountain range and had to hike our way up while it was dark and wait up the top. It took us around two hours to reach the top of the mountains, if I recall correctly. The mission was to wait on top overnight and sleep for several hours, and before sunrise hid down into the green zone, deep into enemy territory, in order to gain the element of surprise, and in order to assault Taliban positions. This was a very rural area and off the track. It would have been an incredibly difficult place for a civilian to reach. We were incredibly fit and robust, yet found it hard going. At some point during the night, I have no idea what time, but it was dark. My friend, who was next to me, nudged me awake and was looking in front of him at a cave entrance not far in front of us, perhaps 10 to 15 feet in front. I listened closely in order to hear what was going on and noticed that I could hear the sound of what appeared to be a baby crying. This absolutely perplexed my brain, given the location, but several moments later, the really scary thing happened. I noticed that the sound that I was hearing of the baby crying was on a loop, like maybe a five or six second loop, repeating over and over again. Suddenly a rush of terror came over me, and I immediately thought of some strange animal impersonating a vulnerable human, much like the way cats and birds can mimic human sounds. It repeated for maybe five to ten minutes before stopping, then nothing but eerie silence. No movement, no voices nothing. To this day, I have no idea what it could have been. I really doubt it was the enemy forces, as the odds of them knowing we would be there, given the last-minute change, is incredibly unlikely. Plus, it would have been much easier to just attack us. I genuinely believe this was some undiscovered attempting to lure us down into the cave. I have no idea for what purpose, but I don't. It was anything friendly.
I'm also happy to answer any questions you may have. It was over ten years ago, but I will do my best to recall the details. When I was in high school about ten years ago, I witnessed a pair of slightly glowing yellow eyes looking into my house from the back door. The creature probably stood seven, eight feet tall, and the only thing that I could see in the darkness were its glowing yellow eyes. I liked in a suburban neighborhood in East Texas. There was a room full of family in the dimly lit living room, which was connected to this back door. They were eyes for sure, not lights or headlights or anything reflecting off of the glass. I looked into this creature's glass like glowing yellow eyes and felt it was intelligent despite only being able to see its eyes and nothing else. It didn't necessarily scare me per se. I didn't tell anyone at all, actually. I just turned around and smoked on my front porch instead of out back. Does anyone know what creature I might have saw that day? Do you guys think it may have influenced my actions by keeping me calm and not alerting my family members that were just a couple steps away? I think about it every time I see any form of glowing eyes, which is pretty often. Just to clarify things before I describe my encounter, I live in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. I go hunting near a lake around 20 miles where I live, located near a small town every Saturday. Today, just before the afternoon, I was in my usual hunting spot for around half an hour. A few dozen minutes prior, I had seen a few bucks sprint from the woods and down the river bank as if they were running away from something. Then I heard some loud movement coming from the brush across the river. Another buck had come running out from the forest and down the same area where the other buck had gone. This time a giant grizzly bear had stormed out of the brush in pursuit. This thing was absolutely massive, so big that I can see it clear as day from across the river. I could guess it was four meters in length and probably around eight feet in height. The thing was absolutely enormous and muscular and also had a big hump around where the neck was. I watched it run down the side of the riverbank, chasing the buck until it had disappeared into the woods. After that, I no longer felt safe having a gargantuan bear running around my hunting spot, so I left. And I don't feel safe going back. There are no grizzly bears in Saskatchewan, as I only have experience with a few black bears around where I hunt. I've never seen this thing before, let alone a brown bear in my area. Something of this size could devastate the ecosystem if it's invasive. When I was a kid, I had a terrifying experience, which, although I have grown out of, I still remember it, and it kind of bring me chills. One day I was sleeping and had the habit of covering my face while sleeping. I woke in the middle of the night somewhere between two hour or three hours, so I took the cover off because it was hot hands. Then I saw a huge dark figure with big horns standing in the middle of the room. I was terrified and screamed from the fear and immediately covered my face under the blanket, which I stayed under crying from fear till morning. When I had the courage to take off the cover, I was relieved that nothing was there anymore. I always thinking that maybe I'm just imagining because your brain can play tricks on you in the darkness. And, and I was specifically scared of the idea of ghosts and demons and was afraid to sleep alone as a kid. So maybe it was not real. But what I can tell you is that I was not dreaming that night and what I described is exactly what I saw. If any had any experiences like this share, it is good to talk about it so we can feel better move on, cause ever since that time I didn't experience any of that not, even sleep paralysis. So whatever it is, it feeds over your fear, or it is just a fearful kid's hallucination in the dark. As I gazed out over the vast expanse of the Grand Canyon National Park, I couldn't help but feel awestruck by its sheer size and beauty. The towering cliffs, the winding Colorado River far below, and the rich red rock formations all around me were simply breathtaking. 
It was a peaceful moment, but my peace was shattered by a sudden blood-curdling scream that echoed through the canyon. I quickly realized that it was the cry of a park ranger in trouble. I ran towards the sound and soon spotted Ranger Lori lying on the ground, writhing in pain. She was being attacked by a massive furry creature, almost as tall as the trees around us. It was a Bigfoot or Sasquatch or whatever you want to call it, but I knew I was looking at something straight out of a horror movie. The beast was clearly angry, and its eyes locked onto me as I approached. It was clear that it was going to come after me next. I was terrified, but I had to. Act fast. I reached for my gun, but before I could even get it out of my holster, the creature lunged at me, its massive claws flashing in the sunlight. I dodged the first attack, but barely. It was like being hit by a freight train, and I was tossed aside like a rag doll. It was like being hit by a freight train, and I was tossed aside like a rag doll. Creature was relentless. It came at me again and again, each blow knocking me farther and farther away. Finally, I realized that there was no escaping it. I knew that I had to fight back, or I was going to die. I stood up and stared the creature in the eyes. It was a terrifying sight, but I gritted my teeth and prepared to face it head. On, I charged at it, trying to dodge its huge claws, and aimed my gun at its chest. The next few seconds were a blur of violence and chaos. The creature and I collided, and I managed to get a shot off, but it was too late. Its claws raked across my chest, and I fell to the ground, bleeding and gasping for air. The last thing I saw before I lost consciousness was the creature disappearing back into the woods, leaving me there to die. When I awoke, I was in a hospital bed. My wounds were severe, but somehow I had survived. The doctors told me that they had found me just in time, and that I had been lucky to escape with my life. I was grateful to be alive, but the experience had left me deeply shaken. Over the following weeks, I pieced together what had happened. The Bigfoot was real, and it had attacked Ranger Lorry just as it had attacked me. But there was more to the story than that. I learned that there were others who had seen the creature and who had even tried to capture it. And that was when I realized the truth. There was a conspiracy at work. Someone, somewhere, was covering up the existence of this creature. They didn't want people to know that Bigfoot was real and that it was a danger to those who lived and worked in the park. Ranger Lorry had been betrayed and so had I. We had been left to die, sacrificed for the sake of secrecy. It was a bitter pill to swallow, and one that still haunts me to this day. The Grand Canyon National Park is still a beautiful place, but now I see it through a different lens. It's a place where danger lurks in the shadows, and where secrets are kept at all costs. I don't know what the future holds, but one thing is certain. The memory of that terrible day will stay with me for the rest of my life. In the summer of 2017, around 10 p.m., I was in the kitchen watching YouTube videos on my phone when I decided it's time to go to sleep. So I go turn off the light to the kitchen, and, and as I'm walking past one of the kitchen windows that leads to the backyard, I notice someone. At first, I had this gut feeling that told me to look to my peripheral vision, and I look out the kitchen window, and I see a black figure walking across my backyard. At this point, I am frozen with fear, and I see this thing walking across my yard with its bright glowing eyes, and I assume it noticed. Me, since its head tilted my direction, and it suddenly vanished. The figure was completely black, and its body looked like it was made out of fog almost like a black thundercloud, and its only facial textures were these glowing white eyes. Also, its outline of its body had a thin spectrum of colors, similar to the colors of a soap bubble when you look into it. It or the rainbow color of oil when it's dropped on the floor. I have no idea what to even call this thing, but it was a scary experience. Does anyone have a clue what this thing was? About 15 years ago, my wife and two children were leaving our home in Honeycomb. 
just north of Gunnersville off of Highway 431, at the bottom of Grant, Alabama. We were en route to Walmart, about 8, 9 p.m., probably midsummer. A well-lit seems full moon night. We lived for me, around past the lake in Honeycomb. I was driving my old hot rod, a 1964 Ford. There are some persons by the last name of name removed by investigator who always have dogs in the street at their house by the lake. The road white elephant would uh, run by the water's edge in front of their home. The road is about four feet off of the shoreline. The name removed by investigator had two St. Bernard dogs along with their other dog. That particular night, driving past, I saw in the water walking away from the road and shore a large eight feet Sasquatch. I looked back in my rearview mirror and still turned around to look through my back glass. My wife saw my dismay and quickly asked what's wrong. She at that time looked back. I always drive slow by their house as the dogs are always in the road. So she had time to look. All she saw was the ripples in the water as we passed a few trees. It was a full moon night in no wind calm waters. Now what I saw was the eight feet Sasquatch carrying one of the saint burning heads. I in the time that drove by slowly saw the Bigfoot from the knees up carrying the head of the dog. Some flesh was hanging from the neck area. The head was in the Bigfoot's left hand. He was carrying it from the dog hair at the top of the dog head. I said to my wife at that time that if one of those dogs came up missing that the Sasquatch was the reason why. However, both dogs came up missing, and we never saw them again after that time. Now story up to date, telling the story to many persons in the years passing as people tell stories. I finally told the guys at the TV where I work as a contractor for the government. My relationship with Mr. Name removed by investigator is just knowing each other from the window of our vehicle as we would wave to one another as our children rode the school bus with each other. I finally one day about four years ago asked him what happened to his dogs and told him the story of what I saw. He said one of the dogs died in Huntsville, Alabama at his mother's home and the other died at his home in Honeycomb and he buried it behind his house. Now, I didn't push the issue of letting me dig up the dog's core as it would be kind of tacky. But if you guys want to contact me and send some investigators to check and see if Mr name removed by investigator would allow you to dig up the core to see if its head is missing you may get some clues or even some hair formed the sasquatch however if the head is still attached then i was hallucinating the whole thing and my wife would just imagine the water ripples too i don't do drugs or smoke dope and didn't at that time either the only thing running through my veins is good wholesome native american blood I would love to participate in pursuing this investigation if there will be one. My first encounter happened late at night while driving home to Snohomish from Sultan. The two towns being about 10 miles apart, I was with my mother and we had just finished dropping a friend off at her home in Sultan. It was late October and there was an unusual storm going on that night that everyone talked about the following day. Tremendous cloud, the cloud lightning and a very cold, dry wind with no rain. Bright flashes of light, loud thunder and lots of leaves blowing around. After dropping our friend off, we were on a stretch of the road that's very dark with farmland on either side of the highway. Highway two and both sides having densely wooded hills we were driving a 1991 Honda Accord, and at this one particular spot in the road, something caught my eye off to the left side, which was a farm field, and there was a break in the guardrail for a dirt road going into the field. Right when we were even to this break, I saw what looked like a huge dog coming up, and right then it ran in front of our car, and I hit it. We could see the top of its back which we both swear looked more like a hyena at this point than a dog. It had to be huge to see its back over the hood of the car. When you're sitting pretty low to the ground in a Honda Accord, its fur was shaggy brown and mottled with dark spots, just like a hyena, 
and its front seemed higher up than its back. The headlights lit it up as it ran right in front of our car, and we could feel it get hit, but didn't see it go either, up in the air or off to the right side of the car. It was running from the left side of the highway to the right. We were driving westward. It sent my car into an uncontrollable swerve back and forth into the oncoming lane, and I just prayed that I could get it under control to keep from getting into a head. On collision with what looked like maybe a Ford Aerostar van, a calmness came over me and I felt like my guardian angel had taken control of the steering because we missed the van by just a few inches. After going a little ways further, we were both so shook up I pulled off to the side. My mother wanted to go look for the dog because we both love animals and felt bad about hitting something. But I had a bad feeling about looking for this dog because it had looked so strange and I was afraid of it. It was dark and stormy. It didn't feel safe, and I just wanted to get home. We got back in the car and stopped at a little gas station. When we first got into Monroe, which is the next town between our town and Salton, we got out to look at the front of my car, thinking surely there would be some evidence of hitting something that large. We were going the highway speed when we hit it, which is 60 miles per hour, like a dent, some fur blood, but there was nothing there, not a scratch. The whole thing had a very supernatural feel to it. The look of this dog, which was huge and looked more like a hyena, just didn't seem right. Neither did the timing of it running in front of us, like it wanted to make a stop on that dark stretch of road and get out of my car, which we did, but we got right back in. I never saw it on two legs. It ran on all fours, but there was something so calculated about the way it came up to the highway and looked at our car and ran in front of it. It seemed planned. It was such a strange electromagnetic type of storm that night, too. The next day, people we knew that lived miles and miles apart in many different directions all talked about the storm and one particularly loud thunderclap that shook everyone's homes. They all thought it was directly over their house, but they were all miles apart. I have three more encounters, which occurred after this first one. I'm pretty sure this happened October 1997, no later than 1998. I am a highway, a Native American, born and raised in a small village deep in the forest. I have always been at home in the woods, but I never imagined that one day I would be fighting for my life against an unknown creature. It happened on a dark and stormy night. I had been out hunting for food when I heard a strange noise. At first I thought it was just the wind, but then I saw it. A creature unlike anything I had ever seen before. It was large and hulking, with eyes that glowed in the darkness. It moved with an eerie grace, and I knew instinctively that it was not something I wanted to mess with. But before I could even think of what to do, the creature attacked me. It came at me with a fury, its claws slashing through the air. I fought back as best I could, using my bow and arrows to try and fend it off. But it was no use. The creature was too powerful, and it overpowered me easily. Just as I thought it was all over for me, the creature suddenly stopped attacking. It looked at me with its glowing eyes, and then it simply disappeared into the darkness. I was left lying on the forest floor, shaken and confused. What was that creature, and why had it attacked me, and why had it suddenly stopped just as it seemed like it was about to finish me off? For weeks after the attack, I searched the forest for any sign of the creature, but I found nothing. It was as if it had never existed in the first place. But I knew that I had not imagined it. The wounds on my body were proof enough that something had attacked me that night. Years passed and I continued to live in the forest, always on the lookout for any sign of the creature that had nearly killed me. But it never appeared again. And I was left with nothing but my confusion and fear. To this day, I still wonder what that creature was and why it had attacked me. Was it simply defending its territory, or was there something more sinister at play? I may never know the truth, but I will always remember the dark and stormy night, and the creature that left me shaken and confused.
I am Manny, a Bigfoot researcher. I was doing a follow-up on an incident that involved two married couples that were camping out at a local skinny dipping rock quarry. This is what took place. There were two groups involved which consisted of two married couples. They were camping together. They had been swimming in the night when they started to hear what appeared to be high-pitched screams at a distance. They then got nervous because this was unlike anything they had ever heard. At that point, they get out of the water and proceed to walk back to camp, their camp only being a minute walk. They had a campfire going and talking among themselves when all of a sudden they started to hear the high-pitched screams once again, but this time much closer and louder this went on. About ten minutes. They started to get very uncomfortable because they knew whatever it was coming toward their location. And then there was silence. Minutes later, they started to hear branches break around their campsite. One of the men got out his point twenty-two caliber rifle out and started shooting. They heard nothing after that took place. Then a while later, the high-pitched scream started again, but from a distance away until they could no longer hear them. They spent the night there and left in the morning. When I did this follow-up, it was two days since it happened. The information that I was able to gather from the location of witness were this. The high-pitched screams were heard from the north to northeast. The area is heavily wooded with some underbrush. This location is pretty much on flat ground. Howard Prairie Lake is under a one-fourth mile away. Given that in this general area was dry, uh, I began to do a perimeter search, walking north from the rock quarry, sweeping the ground for any traces, but after about three hours of looking around, I was unable to find anything. The ground was to dry as well as the grass. Weather was warm and clear skies. I recently found your YouTube channel, Old Texas Scare, and was curious about the Glimmer Man incidents that you have narrated about. I had a similar encounter several years ago. I'm curious as to what you think. The date was Thursday, September 8, 2016. I was on a trip from northwest Pennsylvania to visit a friend in North Carolina. I had been driving for about five and a half hours when I left Route 64 and drove on to Airport Road and came down to a little town called Beaver, West Virginia. I stopped at the KFC to grab something to eat. When leaving, I made a right out of the parking lot onto Route 19. I was driving slowly as I hadn't picked up speed from pulling out yet. Because I was driving slowly, I'm sure I never would have noticed this. I was approaching some leaves spread across the road when I noticed the leaves were moving, but there was no wind blowing. I slowed down, thinking there may be an animal in the leaves, and I didn't want to hit it. I was looking really hard because I could see the leaves moving, but I didn't see an animal. Then I could make out a small bipedal figure about seven or eight inches tall that seemed to be trying to hide in the leaves. As it tried to get across the road, it looked as if I could see a line of each part of the creature, but it seemed to be cloaked, kind of like what a camion does, but not quite the same. It moved with a ratchet-type movement, rather jerky-type movement. I don't know if that was its normal gait or if it was injured. I was driving at a crawl by this time because what I was observing was so bizarre, and I was trying to make out what it was I was thinking. What in the world is this thing? It almost looked like a frail stick figure, as I could only make out some of it. I thought maybe it was an emaciated squirrel, but they don't walk on two feet, and if it was that skinny, it would be dead, not jerking across the road. It was not a featherless bird, either. It had reached the center line and was attempting to cross the rest of the road when a pickup from the other side came speeding along and just missed it with its driver's side tires, and I saw the leaves being thrown. I don't know if it made it or not, his cars behind me were honking at me to keep moving. I thought about turning around to see if I could find it, because that is what I would do for an animal. But this was not an animal that I had ever heard about or had seen before. The more I thought about it, I realized that it may have been cloaked and was picking up the color of the leaves to disguise itself. It reminded me of the cloaked alien in the movie Predator. I could see it, but I couldn't make out exactly what it was. 
As I tried to rationalize this in my head, I thought maybe it was a reptile or a lizard of some kind, like a chameleon that can turn different colors to hide. An octopus can do the same thing, and maybe we have just never seen them know that they are there. When I arrived at my friend's house that night, I told her about it. She never doubted me, as I'm not prone to making up stories. I'm a very rational person. But I still wonder what that thing was, and if these predator-like entities exist all around us. I was a park ranger in the Ozarks, and I loved the beauty of the mountains and the tranquility of the deep woods. The sun was setting, casting a warm golden light over the landscape, as I received a distress call from a park visitor. They said that something strange was happening in the woods, and I knew that I had to check it out. As I drove my jeep through the dense forest, I could feel a sense of unease settle over me. The trees were tall and ancient, their branches reaching up to the sky like twisted fingers. The air was thick with the scent of pine and moss, and the rustling of leaves was the only sound that broke the silence. I arrived at the location of the distress call, and as I stepped out of my jeep, I heard a low growl. I spun around, my hand reaching for my flashlight, but I saw nothing. Suddenly a figure leapt out of the shadows and attacked me, and I realized that I was facing a creature I had never seen before. It was a monster, a twisted, deformed thing with razor-sharp claws and glowing red eyes. I fought for my life, dodging and weaving as the creature attacked me again and again. I managed to grab my gun and shoot it, but it only made it angrier. It howled in rage, and then disappeared into the woods. I was confused and frightened, and I had no idea what had just attacked me. I called for backup, and soon a team of rangers arrived to search the woods, but we found nothing, no sign of the creature, no trace of its attack. The only evidence was the torn fabric of my shirt and the bruises on my body. I knew that the Ozarks were full of mysteries and secrets, but I never imagined that there was something like this lurking in the woods. I was determined to find out what had attacked me and why, but I knew that I was facing a dangerous and deadly enemy. The woods had become a place of terror, and I was no longer sure if I was safe. Days passed, and a team of scientists and wildlife experts were brought in to investigate the strange creature. The woods were scoured for any signs of the monster, but there was no trace of it. As the days went by, more and more people began to report strange sightings and attacks, and it was clear that there was something dangerous and unpredictable in the woods. Some said that it was a monster, while others claimed that it was a ghost or a demon. I was still haunted by my encounter with the creature, and I felt a deep sense of responsibility to protect the park and its visitors. I knew that I had to find a way to stop the monster before it could hurt anyone else. So I began to do my own research, consulting with Native American elders and local hunters who had lived in the area for generations. They told me stories of a mysterious beast that was said to roam the Ozarks, a monster that was half man and half beast. They called it the Skookum, and it was said to be a creature of evil, with a thirst for human flesh. I was skeptical at first, but as I dug deeper, I began to realize that there might be some truth to the legends. I pieced together the clues, and finally, I had a plan. I would lure the skookum out of hiding, using myself as bait, and then trap it once and for all. I set out into the woods, armed with my wits and my courage, and I waited for the monster to come. I could feel its presence, could hear its breathing in the darkness, and then, with a roar, it attacked. I fought the skookum with everything I had, and in that moment I knew that this was the fight of my life. The battle was long and brutal, but finally I was able to injure the monster. Unfortunately, Beast fled, and we never saw it again. In a night case, the Ozarks were safe once again. I was hailed as a hero, but I knew that the real heroes were the people who had helped me. The people who had believed in me and given me the strength to face the monster. And though I was proud of what I had accomplished, I could never forget the fear and the darkness of that night when I faced the skookum in the heart of the Ozarks.
At the time of this incident, I was a contracted delivery driver for an auto parts distributor. I traveled this section of Interstate 5 Monday through Friday towing a 16 enclosed trailer with my 3 4 ton Dodge four-wheel drive truck. As was typical for a weeknight at 1 o'clock in the morning, there was nearly no other traffic on the road with me. With my cruise control set at 73 miles per hour, my headlights lit up something laying centered in the right-hand lane directly in front of me. I knew there was going to be contact, but rather than swerve and risk losing control, I chose to line up and attempt to strike the object with the undercarriage of my truck. I don't remember touching the brakes or making any atmep to slow down. In the seconds leading up to impact, all I could do was brace myself and wonder what it was that I was about to splatter down the highway. Driving as many miles as I did, I had, or thought I had, seen every form of indigenous wildlife Oregon has to offer, either alive and scampering or squished beside the road. I didn't need to see more than a glimpse of fur to identify a critter, even at night. As I closed on this object, I couldn't identify it. It had the coloration of deer, but it was much bigger. It wasn't an elk, as I didn't see any legs or the characteristic outline of the hip, shoulders, and tappered neck had it been laying the other way. This was fast turning from an object to a body, a large hairy body laying in the fetal position, with its back facing me. As weird as this was, it was about to get even more interesting. Confused with what I was seeing, embraced for what was going to be a bumpy ride, something flashed directly in front of my bumper from left to right. As close as this thing was to my truck, all I could see was the flash of brownish-gray hair as it crossed in front of me. It was like sitting parked in a car at night and someone walks from one side of the car to the other. All you see is the strobe effect as they pass in front of the headlights. But I was moving at 70 miles per hour. I'm 5 feet 10 tall and if I stood next to the headlights on my truck, my shoulders are at the height of the headlights. What I saw was more the rib section of the creature that crossed in front of me. Whatever this was, it was big enough, strong enough, fast enough, and felt the need to pull a 600-pound creature out of the way of my truck because not only did I miss what ran in front of me, I didn't hit anything. My friends and I used to camp a lot in the El Dorado National Forest. We had a spot along Safago Springs. We used to camp it a lot. One weekend, we decided to go for a three-day foraging camp. We brought in MREs in case we couldn't find anything, some guns and some supplies to set up shelter, but that's about it. First night was chill. We cooked a bunch of crawdads and a squirrel my buddy shot, drank a few beers we'd brought, and slept fine. Next day, something felt off to me. One of my friends who was with me, and I had had some really creepy experiences in this part of the forest in the past, and it felt a bit like those. Forest was dead silent, and you felt like something was watching you. I grew up in the woods, so I know the signs of a predator, but this felt different than a bear or a mountain lion. When night fell, my friends went 200 yards or so up the stream to do some stuff, and I was alone in camp. The feeling got even stronger. So I built up the fire nice and big and grabbed a gun. I kept hearing faint voices from the woods in the opposite direction of where my friends went. They were low, indistinct sounds, but they were creeping me out majorly, and my buddies had taken the only two flashlights for planning and hindsight. As I peered out into the darkness, I caught a glimpse of something moving 50 yards or so out in the trees. I snapped the rifle to my shoulder and got the scope on it. It was pretty dark, and the only light was from the fire, but I could see the outline of what I was aiming at. It looked human, but was on all fours, and its arms seemed a lot longer than they should. It stood a bit like an ape, but very low to the ground. I only saw it for a second before it loped off deeper into the woods. After I lost track of it, I'd hear light rustling in different directions around the camp, leaves scuffling, the occasional twig breaking all the ways away from where my friends went in the 180 percent on the other side of the camp from their departure. I got the sense that, whatever it was, it was stalking me. 
I kept the fire high and was staying sharp looking out into the woods, but I didn't see it again. My buddies came back about ten minutes later to find me a paranoid wreck glassing the tree line with a scope. I told them what happened and they got quiet, then told me the reason they came back when they did is they started hearing the same stuff I did over by where they were at and it spooked them. We spent the second night of our trip with a big-ass fire and three lookouts. Nobody slept that night. In the morning, we broke camp as quick as we could and hightailed it out of there. We never camped in that spot again. I was a park ranger at an American national park known for its lush forests and towering mountains. The stillness of the night was only broken by the occasional hoot of an owl and the rustling of leaves and the gentle breeze. I was on patrol in my jeep, scanning the surroundings for any signs of danger or disturbance. As I drove down a remote road, I suddenly saw a light in the distance. I decided to check it out. As I got closer, I realized that the light was moving, almost as if it was alive. I couldn't explain it but I had a feeling that something was off. I got out of my jeep and approached the source of the light, my hand instinctively reaching for my flashlight. To my shock, what I saw was a ghostly figure, its translucent body glowing eerily in the moonlight. The ghost was dressed in tattered clothes and had a wicked grin on its face. I felt a chill run down my spine as the ghost suddenly burst into a fit of evil laughter. I tried to talk to the ghost, to find out what it wanted, but it just disappeared into the woods, leaving me confused and scared. I quickly jumped into my jeep and drove back to the park headquarters, unsure of what had just happened and what the ghost wanted from me. The next morning I couldn't shake off the feeling of unease from the night before. I told my colleagues about the ghost, but they didn't believe me. They thought I was just imagining things, but I knew what I saw. I decided to investigate further and started to gather information about the history of the park. I found out that the park was built on sacred Native American land and that there had been several reports of ghost sightings over the years. Days went by and the ghost continued to haunt me. I would see it at night, always laughing and taunting me. I couldn't sleep or eat and my colleagues were starting to become worried about my mental state. One night, I finally couldn't take it anymore. I grabbed my flashlight and headed back to the spot where I saw the ghost. I called out to it, demanding to know what it wanted from me. Suddenly, the ghost appeared, its form becoming more solid. It told me that the park was built on sacred land and that it was angry that its resting place had been disturbed. The ghost demanded that I help it put the spirits of its ancestors to rest by performing a sacred ceremony. I knew that I had to do what the ghost asked, and I worked with local Native American leaders to perform the ceremony. After the ceremony was complete, the ghost finally disappeared, and I was able to sleep peacefully for the first time in weeks. From that day on, I made sure to respect the land and the spirits that inhabited it, and I never saw the ghost again. But I will never forget that frightening encounter and the lesson it taught me about the importance of respecting the dead and the land they call home. However, my colleagues and I started to notice strange occurrences happening around the park. Trees would shake for no reason, and strange whispers could be heard in the wind. Some of the visitors even reported seeing ghostly apparitions in the woods. We soon realized that the ghost was not the only one who was angry. There were others who had also been disturbed by the park's construction, and they were seeking revenge. One night, I received a distress call from one of the camping sites. When I arrived, I found that several tents had been destroyed and several people were missing. I searched the surrounding area and eventually stumbled upon a clearing where I saw the ghostly apparitions standing together, holding the missing people captive. I realized that I had to do something to stop them, but I was only one person against many angry spirits. I remembered the ceremony that I performed with the Native American leaders and knew that I had to perform it again, this time with the help of my colleagues. We gathered together and performed the ceremony, calling upon the spirits of the land to restore balance and peace. To our surprise, the ghostly apparitions disappeared and the missing people were released unharmed. 
From that day on, the park was at peace and the spirits that had once haunted it were finally at rest. I learned that sometimes the things that scare us the most can teach us the greatest lessons and that the land we live on must be respected and honored. We were camping with a summer adventure program at Indian Crossing. When it started to get darker, we decided to play a game similar to Capture the Flag. My friend and I left a few minutes early to go hide when we saw a large object or creature that had red eyes in the glare of our flashlight. It was too tall to be a bear and too big to be a human, and the eyes weren't a deer's eyes because they were for sure red. It wasn't moving really, but we didn't get to see it for very long because we got scared and ran back to camp. We told Jeff, our camp leader, what had just happened, and he seemed to have believed us, unlike all the other kids. We were still scared, but Jeff wanted to go exploring to see if we could find more evidence. We found broken trees and also fallen logs that were ripped open somehow. I don't know if Jeff was just trying to scare us or not, but he said there was a dead deer on the side of the road that was nearby the campground that, that didn't look like it got hit by a car. About a half of a year later, my mom said she talked to this botanist that was at Blue Hole, a place about two miles from the Bigfoot sighting, and she saw tracks that were really big and couldn't be human. She took pictures of the tracks, but I hadn't, I hadn't seen yet. My friend and I honestly think we saw Bigfoot, so we have been doing all this research. We are destined to find Bigfoot again and prove everyone wrong. In October of 2020, one, I encountered what I believed to be an extraterrestrial inside my house, followed soon after by three other extraterrestrials in my house. It was a normal Friday evening at first. My dad, I was in college in Montana, living with him at the time, had gone to sleep at about 10 p.m., and I stayed up until about 11.30. At 11.30, turned off my TV and went to lay on my bed, where I promptly pulled out my phone and began browsing. This lasted for about 45 minutes before I finally decided to go to sleep. I realized that my throat felt a little dry, so I got up to get some water from the fridge. My room used to be a second living room off the kitchen, so there's no door on the frame, only a thick curtain. As I approached the curtain, everything was normal. It was just a normal night. The only thing that seemed a little off was how quiet it was. There were no crickets chirping outside, which there always were. I live in a secluded country ranch house, which was unusual. I could still hear my dad's white noisemaker in his bedroom, though he uses it to help him sleep. It felt like a normal late night. I pulled the curtain aside to step out into the kitchen and experience the single most terrifying thing in my entire life. Behind the curtain was what I believed to be an extraterrestrial or alien. It was facing the hallway to my dad's room and it was in a crouched position. We had a nightlight plugged in right above the kitchen countertop, so I assume it was trying to avoid that light. Its skin color was a sort of dark gray or gunmetal color. As I pulled the curtain all the way back, the alien turned its head sharply to look at me. I gasped and was immediately overcome by an immense sense of dread and terror. I was quite literally paralyzed by fear. I just stood there with my hand on the curtain, mouth agape. It stared at me for a couple of seconds, and then everything went black. I regained consciousness an hour later and was laying on top of my bed, the covers still made. My heart was pounding, and it felt like it was beating a million times a minute. I saw something on my left, which was the darkest part of my room, and at a door leading to our carport. Standing over my bed were three dark gray figures. They were tall, their heads nearly touching the seven-foot ceilings in my room. I turned my head, stared at them, and began to experience the same sense of terror as before. It was the exact same sense of dread and paralysis. I was unable to move, unable to speak, unable to do anything except look. This time they looked at me for much longer than a couple of seconds. It felt like it lasted a full minute or more. At the end of that minute, 
The being in the middle leaned in a little bit and moved its hand toward my foot. It tapped its finger on my foot three times, slowly. Each time it tapped, a strange sensation pulsed through my body. It was just a weird energy that I can't really describe. After the third pulse subsided, the being stood straight again, and then everything went black again. I regained consciousness yet again a minute or two later. Still on top of my bed, covers still made, and immediately began to cry. I don't mean just a tear or two. I mean that I was quite literally just bawling my eyes out for the next few minutes. Eventually, all that emotion subsided, and I grabbed my phone from my bedside table. It was 1.33 a.m. I didn't end up going to sleep at all that night. I just sort of sat there on my bed trying to explain to myself what just happened. In the years since this has happened, I have yet to come up with an explanation that doesn't involve aliens, demons, ghosts, or some sort of paranormal phenomenon. I thought of sleep paralysis at first, but I never went to sleep before I saw the first one. I was wide awake still when I went to get a drink of water. I wasn't dreaming because I hadn't yet gone to sleep. When the three came right after, I thought that it could be sleep paralysis since I woke up on my bed and was unable to move or even scream when they looked at me. But how did I get in bed when the last thing I remember was looking at the first one in my kitchen? I know you hallucinate when experiencing sleep paralysis, but how did I see three distinct beings that essentially remained motionless? And what was that sensation whenever it tapped my foot? If it was sleep paralysis, I've never had it before, and I haven't had it since. If it was some sort of spontaneous mental breakdown, I've never had one before, and haven't had one since. If it was just some bad nightmare, when did I go from browsing Reddit and getting a drink of water to asleep and having a nightmare? Every time I think about it, I get an uneasy feeling just thinking about the dread I felt that night. It makes me feel squirmy and nervous. That night felt like death, but I don't know if whatever was in my house or whatever I imagined was malevolent. I don't know if they hurt me or did anything to me or my dad. I don't know if I was crazy, sleep, deprived, or actually encountered aliens in my house. I've seen and felt some strange things before and after, including lost time, seeing what I believe to be UFOs and animals on the ranch we live on being mutilated. The lost time thing was a little freaky. I was texting my brother about video games in the middle of the morning. I was in the middle of a response laying on the bed in my room when all of a sudden I was sitting on the couch in the first living room opposite the kitchen to my bedroom. Seven whole hours had passed and I didn't remember any of it. There were two texts from my brother, about an hour apart, the first of which was him asking if I got his text. Then the second was just a couple of question marks. I was confused and didn't really know what to do. The UFOs thing is self-explanatory. I've seen lights fly over my house at night. There's an airport about an hour away and I see planes on occasion, but these lights are always either too fast to be a plane, too slow to be a plane, or too quiet to be a low-flying helicopter. The animal mutilation thing is the saddest part for me. I have about ten outside cats or barn cats that I feed regularly and who keep away snakes, bugs, and whatnot. Most of them are spayed, neutered, and vaccinated, but new ones show up still and get pregnant somehow. Every so often, one of them gets killed, be it by a mountain lion, stray dog, coyote, or other cat. It's gruesome, but it happens. But there have been a couple in the past few months that have made no sense, and all have been the same way. A single cut down the middle of their bodies, running from their jaw all the way to their genitalia. The cut goes all the way through their sternum and everything. It's always perfectly straight, and none of their internal organs or anything is damaged. It's like someone took a razor or something and slit them. We found them on our driveway and the private road leading to our driveway. There's never any blood, and the cat is just dead on the ground already in rigor mortis. It makes no sense, and it makes me sad because I've raised most of those cats from kittens.
I stayed after school one late December afternoon, 2022, two months ago, in the Roanoke, Virginia area for a basketball game. After the game, I walked to the nearby church lot waiting for my dad. It was already dark. As I stood waiting, I felt like someone or something was watching me. I turned around and saw the shadow of a man behind a bush. I instantly ran to the other side of the street. I caught my breath and slowly walked back to the other side of the church. I would be able to see my dad drive up, drive up. As I stood there, keeping an eye out for my dad and for other shadows, I saw two deer along the edge of the woods. I put some space between me and the deer. I watched the deer as they began to move around. I watched closely as one of the deer seemed to have a bad back leg or was injured. I began to walk in the direction of the deer in order to get a better look. When I came within twenty feet or so of the deer, I stopped. I was literally frozen and terrified at the same time. I realized that these were not deer. They both had oddly shaped heads with patches of hair that seemed to be stitched onto their bodies. It actually looked like human skin was underneath the patches. Then both deer looked in my direction and slowly stood up on their back legs. They then started to run in my direction, chasing me back to the church lot. I was yelling and running at the same time, so loud that my dad heard me a block away. I ran toward my home neighborhood, but my dad happened to see me and caught up. As he stopped ahead of me, I jumped into the passenger seat, yelling, Go! 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 He asked me what the hell was I yelling and running for. I couldn't answer him. I was absolutely freaked out. The ten-minute drive home was surreal as I was thinking about what I had experienced and what I was going to tell my dad. When we got home, and after I calmed down a bit, my mom and dad sat at the dining room table with me and listened to my description of the encounter. They actually listened. They knew by my demeanor that something had really occurred. Later that night, while I was in my room watching television, my dad came into my room and wanted to talk. He told me about an encounter that he had several years previously with a deer while he and my uncle were hunting in the nearby mountains. His description was very much like mine. He had told my mom about it at the time, so now I know why they didn't question my sanity when we talked. Can you tell me what I encountered that day? I see references to Wendigos and not deer when I started to research on Google. Is that what I witnessed? Is that what my dad witnessed? My experience is from late 2006, just before winter break of my freshman year of college. I went to a small college in rural western Pennsylvania, and the freshman parking lot was on the edge of campus up against some state game lands. We'd go out there a couple of nights a week to smoke some weed, and that night went to our usual spot in a clearing with a fallen log to sit on just past what you could see from the parking lot, though we could see the lights from the lot through the trees behind us. Now I'm sure you're already thinking it was probably just the weed but we were veteran smokers, had just started smoking that night and had been smoking out of the same bag previous nights without any weird things happening. We packed a bowl and had maybe one hit each as we sat there talking quietly. It was winter and this night was particularly cold, like in the teens, Fahrenheit, but very still, no wind, almost nothing making sound out in the woods where we were. I took my first hit and handed the bowl and lighter back to my friend, then looked up to exhale. That's when I saw it through the smoke, a humanoid face in the trees on the other side of the clearing, opposite the parking lot. It was just above a branch that it had hand-wrapped around. I think it had three fingers with a very long, narrow thumb that stuck out several inches past its other fingers, each tipped with a pointed nail. As the smoke cleared, I got a better look at its face. Very pale, almost grayish skin, bald, no eyebrows, no other hair of any kind, no ears that I could see, big eyes relative to its head that were very dark in color, catching just a little bit of light from the lights of the parking lot behind us, which made them seem kind of reflective. 
I didn't get a great look at the nose or mouth as I was fixated on the eyes, but from what I recall, they seemed small relative to its head compared to a human. I tapped my friend's knee and quickly glanced over at him to see if he saw it as well, and he was starting at it too, so it's something we both saw independently. I looked back at it just as it released its hand from the branch, revealing very long, thin fingers to match the thumb, and then it moved backwards out of our sight without making a sound, even though there were dry leaves all over the ground. I'd guess only about five seconds actually passed during this span, but it felt much longer and there was this odd calm over the whole situation. As soon as it was out of sight, however, my friend and I both felt intense fear, and we ran back to the parking lot. It was in such a panic that he didn't realize he had stuffed the still-smoking bowl into his coat pocket and dropped the lighter. We ran to the opposite side of the lot from the woods where there was a road, some cars passing, and some other students walking around where we finally felt safe. There was an initial, oh my God, did you see that? What was that? kind of conversation before we calmed down and talked about the details of what we saw, which matched up perfectly. The only thing he noticed that I didn't was that he said he didn't think it even had a mouth. We thought maybe it was a classic gray alien or something, but knew no one would believe us and didn't tell anyone else. The next day we went back to the spot in the woods and found our lighter standing up right on the log we were sitting on. The odds of it falling and landing like that are very, very low, adding another creepy factor. Did this thing find it and put it there? We also walked over to the tree where we saw it and found the branch it was grasping. It was a good 10, 12 feet above the ground. We couldn't even reach it by jumping and there was nothing around. No stumps, no rocks, no lower branches that it could have been standing on so it had to be tall to appear there. Weirdly, the leaves on the ground had been disturbed all around the area beneath the tree. Not like, just tracks or something, but it was as if something had intentionally brushed the leaves away and then dug some shallow holes, maybe four or six of them about six, eight inches deep and two, three inches wide. My friend was a biology major who had been an Eagle Scout and now works in a state park, so he knew a good deal about most of the area's wildlife and didn't know of anything that would disturb the ground in that fashion. Plenty of animals dig, but they don't sweep away an area, probably five feet by five feet of leaves like that just to dig a couple of holes like that. He couldn't find any other tracks leading away from the area either. We never went back out there after dark again and never saw it again either. Anyway, that's my possible encounter with a crawler. Make of it what you will. This takes place in March, April of 2013. Me and a friend had just been to the movies and was just walking around at 10.45 p.m. We decided we would take a shortcut through the skewer of our old school, which had since been abandoned and was in pretty bad shape. As we walked through the schoolyard, we decided to try to get inside the school building and explore a little bit. Now the school consists of two wings, so the building is an L shape if viewed from above. It is three stories tall and has three entrances. The main entrance leads in to a kind of main hall which connects the two wings. Each wing has staircases in each end of the corridors which lead to the different floors. This is important later. One of the windows right by the entrance to the lower wing was actually wide open, so we could easily get in. We were now in the basement. We used our cell phones as flashlights and made sure not to point them towards the windows to avoid being seen. Even though the building was not in use, there was still a lot of stuff left just laying around. Musical equipment, uniforms, a pool table, chairs, etc. So we were just exploring each room in the basement to see if we could find anything cool. We explored the basement for about 15 minutes before we headed up to the first floor, and we were now in the main hall. There was some kind of tarp or large plastic sheet hanging there to separate the hall and the lower wing for some reason. I assume it was for some kind of construction work. We went down one of the corridors and started exploring the classrooms. 
Every classroom had been either vandalized or suffered some kind of water damage, so everything was pretty broken down and rotting. In hindsight, I think we were lucky the floors didn't collapse on us or something. We had just come out of the third classroom and were in the corridor when we heard someone moving the tarp, plastic sheet, in the main hall. This was not wind or anything. We could definitely tell someone was physically moving it. We could also hear footsteps, although the rhythm of the steps was kind of weird. It sounded like someone changed their walking pace sporadically, if that makes any sense. We immediately went inside a classroom to hide, as we thought someone had called security on us. We hid behind the door in the classroom for about two minutes, dead quiet. We didn't hear anything else during this time, so we figured it had to be the wind or just random noises. We decided to keep going. We went through the corridor and up the stairs in the other end from the main hall and explored the second floor. While we were there, we would occasionally hear some noises, but we just brushed it off as wind. After a while, we had explored the rest of the corridor, and we decided to walk down the staircase that led from the second floor to the hall. Halfway down the staircase, there was this plateau before the second set of stairs, and this is where things took a turn. No pun intended. We could see the plastic from there, and it was moving. We also heard some kind of scratching noise. We stood there for a second just listening, and I decided to peek around the corner to see what was making that sound. What I saw scared the living crap out of me. It was some kind of creature. It was skinny, almost completely naked, couldn't see any clothes at least. Had really thin strands of hair and was really pale, like corpse. Pale, almost completely white. The first thing that came to mind was that this thing looked like Gollum, just bigger. It was crouching down and was scratching the floor or something, and it made some weird, growly, groany, breathy noises. It was facing away from us, so I just stood frozen for a good while and watched it. I took a step back and just pointed at this thing and looked at my friend. He peeked around the corner and immediately I could see his facial expression change into a combination of horror and shock. It was reassuring in a way knowing that he saw it too. We just stood there for a good twenty seconds just watching this thing do whatever it was doing, and the most cliché horror movie thing happened. My friend started backing away slowly, and while doing so, stepped on a piece of glass that cracked. This startled the creature, and it quickly looked over its shoulder right at me. I just bolted at that point. We ran all the way to the basement to get out, and the whole way there, I swear, it felt like it was right behind us. We ran back to my friend's house, and when we got there, we had a kind of debriefing session, making sure we both saw the same thing. The closest thing to a reference picture I can find is this. It pretty much looked exactly like that, just with thin strands of hair on its head. I understand if you think I'm lying, I would be skeptical if someone else told this story. But I swear this actually happened and my friend confirms it to this day. We got a good enough look at it to confirm that it was a humanoid creature of some sorts, but it didn't really resemble a human being. The only explanation I can think of is that it was a homeless dude that for some reason was naked in this abandoned school. But this is in northern Norway during winter. You wouldn't survive very long without clothes. Also, I live in a very small town with very few if any homeless people, so that theory wouldn't really make sense. It could also be some kind of animal that had found its way inside, but we got a good look at it, and it didn't resemble any animal I've seen before. I have no idea what that thing was. I am normally irrational, a camp's razor kind of person, but we saw what we saw, and I have no explanation for it. I am John, a seasoned park ranger. I know these woods like the back of my hand, or so I thought. One day I received a call that changed everything. A murder had occurred in the park, and no one knew who did it. When I arrived at the scene, it was clear that no human could have committed such a heinous act. The victim's body was mangled, and deep claw marks were etched into the ground. As I began to investigate, a feeling of dread came over me. 
I knew that something terrible was lurking in these woods, something not of this world. And then I saw it, a creature unlike any I had ever seen before. It stood over eight feet tall, with razor-sharp claws and eyes that glowed like fiery embers. Its breath was hot and putrid, and its movements were quick and precise. I knew I had to catch this beast before it killed again, but as I pursued it deeper into the woods, I realized that I might not make it out alive. The predator was nowhere to be found, and I was getting frustrated. I knew that if I didn't solve this case soon, more lives would be in danger. I went back to the scene of the crime and found a small scrap of fur that looked like it belonged to the predator. I sent it to the lab for analysis and waited anxiously for the results. When they finally came in, my worst fears were confirmed. The predator was a genetically modified creature that had escaped from a nearby laboratory. I immediately contacted the lab and informed them of the situation, and they sent a team to recapture the creature. But the creature was too strong and too smart for them. It outsmarted the scientists and managed to escape yet again. I knew that it was only a matter of time before it struck again. I spent every waking moment searching for the predator, tracking it down through the thick underbrush and deep into the heart of the park. As I closed in on it, I knew that this would be the moment of truth. Would I be able to stop it before it killed again? With my heart pounding in my chest, I came face to face with the creature. It was enormous, with razor-sharp claws and teeth like knives. But I was determined not to back down. I drew my weapon and prepared to fight for my life. The creature lunged at me, and we engaged in a vicious battle. It was like nothing I had ever experienced before. But I was determined to come out on top. In the end, I managed to take down the predator and save countless lives. As I stood there gasping for breath and covered in blood, I knew that I had made the right decision to become a park ranger. I had protected the park and the people who visited it, and I had proved that even in the face of great danger. A single person can make a difference. When I was 19, I worked as a stalker for Target and had to bike to work early every morning around 4 a.m. Worst job ever. One morning I got on the bike and began pedaling the five miles like usual. After a while I got the weirdest feeling. I could feel that something was following me. I can't explain it any better than that. It was like a sixth sense. But here's the kicker. I could feel that whatever was following me was following me from the air, behind me and up in the sky. My heartbeat quickened and I started pedaling faster. Movies were pouring through my head. Jeepers Creepers, Lost Boys, Interview with a Vampire, any movie that has a scene in which something flies down and onto someone into someone in a vehicle. At this point I'm expecting my rational brain to kick in and do its usual thing anytime I'm in a dark room or alone in an alley and relax me. It doesn't and the feeling gets progressively more powerful. I am now sure that something is following me and is getting closer. I can remember my vision almost seemed to blur as my hearing became more crisp. My body was shifting gears from one sensory preset to another. My back felt as sensitive as my palms. Finally I get the balls to look behind me. Nothing. Nothing there. I keep pedaling faster and faster. And I look behind me again. There is something there. I can't tell what it is. It's dark. A hundred feet up and following me. Now I start to crap in my pants. I can remember being incoherent almost, as if my body had shut down all higher functioning and replaced it with robotic movement. I remember thinking of Discovery Channel shows where the gazelle runs from the lion, and I know I'm the gazelle. I was simply waiting for whatever it was to land on me at this point. Me and my bike eventually burst into an empty but well-lit intersection and start heading down the hill to Target. The feeling lets up as suddenly as it seized me and I knew I was safe. I looked around me and up in the sky and everything was fine. Nothing there. I'm not sure what happened that morning, eleven years ago, but as you can see, I remember almost every second of it.
I am John, an African-American park ranger stationed in the remote mountains of the Appalachian Trail. My job was to patrol a vast wilderness and make sure that everyone who entered it, hiker, camper, or otherwise, was safe and secure. It was a warm summer day, and I was on my usual rounds when I stumbled upon something that would change my life forever. I was following a trail of broken branches and torn shrubs when I heard a loud roar in the distance. I thought it was a bear at first, but when I reached the source of the noise, I was faced with something far more terrifying. It was a Bigfoot, a massive bipedal creature covered in fur, standing at least ten feet tall. I had heard stories of these creatures before, but I never believed they were real. But there it was, right in front of me, and it was angry. I was frozen in fear, but I managed to draw my sidearm and take a shot at the creature. It didn't even flinch, and I soon realized that bullets were not going to be enough to stop it. The Bigfoot charged at me, and I ran as fast as I could. I stumbled upon a cave and crawled inside, hoping that the Bigfoot wouldn't be able to fit through the entrance. But to my horror, it was able to squeeze inside, and I was trapped. The Bigfoot began to tear through the cave, looking for me, and I was running out of options. That's when I remembered the stories that my grandfather used to tell me about the Native American spirits that lived in these woods. I started to pray to them, and begging for their help, and that's when I heard a voice. It was soft at first, but it grew louder and more insistent, until it was a roar. The Bigfoot was thrown back from the cave entrance, and I was able to escape. I never saw the creature again, but I knew that it was still out there, waiting for its next victim. I soon found out that there were other people in these woods, and that they were searching for something. They were a secret service, investigating a series of strange and paranormal occurrences. They thought that I knew something, and they started to follow me, always watching me, always waiting for me to slip up. I was in over my head, and I didn't know who to trust. But I knew one thing for sure. I'm quitting my job. The pay is not worth the trouble of fighting various cryptids in woods. The Appalachian Mountains rise tall and proud with their rugged peaks and dense forests that stretch as far as the eye can see. As a park ranger and a native of the area, I was no stranger to the beauty and majesty of the mountains. But even I was not prepared for what I encountered one fateful night. I received a distress call from my tribe who were residing deep within the Appalachian woods. They told me that something strange was happening in the forest, and that they needed my help. I immediately set out to investigate, knowing that the safety of my tribe was at stake. As I approached the reservation, I was struck by the beauty of the forest. The towering trees loomed over me, casting dappled shadows on the forest floor. The sound of rustling leaves and rushing water filled the air, and I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe and reverence for the land. But my sense of wonder was short-lived as I was patrolling the reservation. I was suddenly attacked by an unknown predator. It was a monster unlike anything I had ever seen before. Its eyes were wild, and its howls echoed through the forest. It was a wendigo, a spirit of the northern forests that was said to drive people mad with hunger. I fought back with all my strength, but the wendigo was too powerful. I managed to wound it, but it disappeared into the forest before I could finish it off. I was left confused and disoriented, struggling to make sense of what had just happened. Eventually, my tribe found me, and I told them what had transpired in the forest. They were shocked and frightened by my story, and they feared that the Wendigo would return. But I was determined to protect my tribe, and the next day I set out into the forest once again, this time armed with preparation. I knew that the conflict with the Wendigo was not over, but I was ready for the challenge. I knew that the safety of my tribe and the balance of the forest were at stake, and I was determined to put an end to the terror of the Wendigo once and for all. Again, as I entered the forest, I felt a strange sense of calm wash over me. I knew that I was not alone, that my ancestors were with me, guiding me towards the Wendigo. The sound of rustling leaves grew louder, and out of nowhere he appeared in front of me. I soon found myself facing the monster once again. This time I was ready. 
I called upon the spirits of the land and reached for a twelve gauge. An exciting feeling surged through my body. The Wendigo howled in rage as it felt the bullet go through its thick skin. Unfortunately, it lunged at me with its razor-sharp claws. Our battle was intense, and the forest shook with the fury of our fight. The Wendigo was strong, but I was stronger. I could feel the power of my ancestors flowing through me, and I knew that I was going to win. With one final bullet, I defeated the Wendigo, and he just turned over and ran. The forest grew quiet, and I felt a sense of peace settle over the land. The balance had been restored, and my tribe was safe once again. I returned to the reservation where my tribe was waiting for me. They welcomed me with open arms, and I could see the relief in their eyes. They knew that I had saved them from the Wendigo, and they were grateful. From that day on, I was known as the protector of the Appalachian Woods, and my tribe held me in high esteem. I learned that the magic of the land was powerful and that it was our duty to respect and protect it so that future generations could enjoy the beauty and majesty of the mountains. As a park ranger, Adam had seen his fair share of strange things, but nothing had prepared him for what he encountered one night while patrolling the forest. It started with a strange noise, like a cross between a growl and a scream. Adam's first thought was that it was a bear or a mountain lion, but the sound was unlike anything he had ever heard. He cautiously made his way towards the source of the noise, flashlight in hand. The deeper he went into the woods, the more uneasy he became. It was as if something was watching him, something that shouldn't be there. Suddenly he heard the noise again, louder this time and closer. Adam shone his flashlight ahead and froze. Standing in front of him was a creature unlike anything he had ever seen. It was tall, with fur as black as the night, and eyes that seemed to glow with an otherworldly light. Its jaws were open, revealing rows of sharp teeth. Adam tried to back away slowly, but the creature stepped forward, blocking his path. He raised his flashlight as a weapon, but it seemed useless against this creature. The creature lunged at him and Adam ran as fast as he could. He could hear the creature's footsteps behind him, and he knew he was in grave danger. But just when he thought he was done for, he burst through the trees and into a clearing. The creature stopped at the edge of the clearing, snarling and pacing back and forth. Adam could see the fear in its eyes, and he realized that it was just as scared of him as he was of it. After a few tense moments, the creature turned and disappeared into the woods. Adam collapsed onto the ground, shaking with adrenaline and relief. He never spoke of the creature to anyone, afraid that they would think he was crazy. But every time he patrolled the woods, he couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching him from the shadows. I was house-sitting for a friend in an ill-planned housing development out in the middle of nowhere. Everybody in the development had pooled their money and gone on a two-week cruise together. My friend didn't have cable yet, so I amused myself most nights by defending his refrigerator from a beer invasion. There was nobody for company but the one guy who had just moved in down the street and his great Dane-sized mixed-breed dog named Cujo, who hated me. Power went out one night and we're standing in the road drinking the beer so it doesn't spoil. Any excuse, right? Mm. Talking about how spooky the place is, only lit by moonlight when we hear a cougar. Two things you need to know about a cougar's roar. One, they sound exactly what you'd imagine a woman being tortured to death would sound like. And two, they sound like they're right behind you, even if they're a mile away. Cujo's hackles rise and he starts growling, staring off into the distance. More roars. I explained to the guy that it's a cougar, it's miles away, but the sound carries. That's a mating cry and not a hunting cry. Nothing for Cujo to be afraid of, etc. Then we hear a second roar. This one literally sounds like it's ten feet away. Cujo cuts his head around, ends his growl with a little squeak and stares at a spot right behind me. Right behind me. I very slowly turn around. Nothing is there. The cougar screams happen again, 
one far away and one that I swear is coming from the shadow of the house I'm looking at. I turned to the guy that suggested maybe we want to go inside now. The guy and the dog were gone. In a few seconds they'd gone far enough to be out of sight on a gravel road without making any sound whatsoever. More screams. This time it seemed like both were coming from the shadows of the houses around me. I'm sure I broke some kind of land speed record getting back to my friend's house. Then I broke another record closing and locking all the windows for the next hour or so, which seemed like a week. I heard screams from different places around the neighborhood. My beer, soaked mine, decided the cougars were trying to figure out which house I was in. When the scream stopped, I was convinced that they'd found me and were closing in. I very quietly started looking for the guns I knew my friend owned, but had hidden very well because he had children in the house. Every time I tried to lie down to go to sleep, I remembered my grandfather's stories about how the reason why cougars sound like a woman screaming is because they really are women screaming. They're humans trapped in cougar form by magic and pissed the hell off about it. Then I'd get up and look for the gun some more. I finally drifted off around dawn. I didn't see Cujo or the guy for the rest of my stay, but it turned out they were okay because my friend later mentioned that his daughters liked inviting them over and riding Cujo like a horse. I have always been fascinated by Yellowstone National Park. The sprawling wilderness dotted with hot springs and geysers is like nowhere else on earth. It's a place of natural beauty and wonder, but also a place of secrets and darkness. I was a park ranger in Yellowstone, tasked with ensuring the safety of all who entered its boundaries. One day I received a report of a missing camper. His friends had gone searching for him, but to no avail. It was my job to pick up the search and bring him back safely. As I ventured into the dense forests of the park, a sense of unease washed over me. The trees seemed to close in on me, blocking out the sunlight. I had a feeling that something was watching me, waiting for the right moment to strike. I pushed on, following the trail left by the missing camper. The deeper I went, the more disturbing the signs became. Broken branches, shredded clothing, and pools of blood dotted the path. And then I found him. The missing camper was lying on the ground, his body torn apart by some unknown beast. The sight was enough to make me nauseous, but I knew I had to investigate further. That's when I heard it, the sound of footsteps. Not human, but something else. Something big and dangerous. I turned around, my hand reaching for my weapon, but it was too late. The creature attacked, its jaws snapping at my flesh. I don't remember much after that. When I woke up, I was in an old cabin deep in the woods. I was being tended to by a woman who claimed to be a member of a secret religious order, tasked with protecting the world from the supernatural. She told me that the creature that had attacked me was a werewolf, one of the many things that the government wanted to keep secret. The Secret Service was aware of the supernatural creatures roaming the park and had assigned her to protect the public from the truth. But as the days passed, I realized that the woman was not who she claimed to be. She was working for the very creatures she was supposed to be stopping, and her true intention was to use me as bait to draw more people into their grasp. I was horrified and scared, but I knew I had to escape. I made a break for it in the dead of night, but the werewolf was hot on my heels. I ran as fast as I could, but the creature caught up to me, its claws tearing into my flesh. I don't know how I managed to survive, but I did. I stumbled out of the woods, my body battered and broken. I was taken to the hospital, but I never fully recovered. I was forever scarred, both physically and mentally, by my experience in Yellowstone National Park. The Secret Service tried to cover up what had happened to me, but the truth leaked out. People began to whisper about the werewolves in the park, and the government was forced to admit to their existence. But for me, the truth came too late. I was forever changed by my encounter with the supernatural, and I could never shake the feeling that I was being watched. The end of my story is tragic, but the terror of what happened in Yellowstone National Park still lives on.
It happened in July of 2012 while I'm off with my boyfriend on vacation. He inherited a small house on an island in Brittany, France. It's called Isle de Groix. It's situated a few kilometers off the south coast of Brittany, and you can only get there with a ferry. It is pretty small, and only a few inhabitants live there all year long. There's not much to do, but it's really beautiful, and it's a nice place for quiet vacation. We like to go for rides during daytime as well as nighttime. Now I'll start telling my story 100% true. So one night, a clear night night, doused in moonlight. It's important to remember that. We went out around midnight for a ride on the island as we were used to do so. We headed to a beach whose name I can't remember that goes along a small family vacation village, VVF. Quick description of the area. The VVF is situated in a big curve bordered by a small road. Alongside the road is a strip of grass and sand. When standing on this strip, you have a really nice view of the beach and the sea which lie below. The road and village are situated on some kind of a steep cliff. To go down to the beach, you have to walk down sheer narrow stairs, situated a few meters away from where we were standing. Kay, my boyfriend, and I were standing by the road on the strip of sand grass since like ten minutes, looking down at the sea. I need to point out that it was a calm, clear night and we hadn't seen anyone during our ride. We were walking along the beach for a while and hadn't noticed anything strange, nor signs of human presence on the beach. No night swimmers, the water is very cold in Brittany even in the summer. No young people having a party on the beach, etc. So we were standing on a cliff facing the sea, when suddenly straight ahead of us we saw a human-shaped figure get out of the water and hurry across the beach. I know, it's nothing scary so far. Except the figure was pitch black, contrasting with the clear sand and was not reflecting any light, like a dark shadow. It's weird cause, remember the moon was shining. We first thought it was someone skinny dipping. Problem is, when you're going out of sea, you first swim to the edge of the sea, then you stand up and walk out of the water. This figure gradually went out all the time standing tall, as if it was walking on the bottom of the ocean. Moreover, Kay and I had been looking at the water for a while and never noticed anyone swimming, as if it was totally emerged for at least ten minutes. At the sight of that, I felt particularly uncomfortable, not to say really freaked out. So was my boyfriend, who is not easily scared. Weirdest part is once the human-shaped figure got out of the water, it headed straight ahead to the foot of the cliff where we were standing, but it wasn't walking or running. It was sliding on the sand, like really fast. A pitch black human, shape with indistinguishable face and features, sliding fast as if on the sand, almost gliding, not moving its legs or anything, leaving no trail or footsteps behind, all the time standing tall and human shape average human sized and built. We stared at it silently until it got a few meters away from the foot of the cliff. Then, without talking, we decided to get the fat out of Dodge, still with this feeling of dread and fear. We never saw or heard of this creature again, and nothing strange happened during the rest of our vacation. My boyfriend, however, has witnessed strange things on the island before, but nothing that's related to this story. I am a park ranger at a remote national park known for its dense forests and rugged wilderness. The peacefulness of the park is broken only by the sounds of the wildlife and the rustling of the leaves. But beneath the tranquil exterior lies a dark and dangerous secret that has been hidden deep within the park for years. One night, as I was on patrol, I heard a strange guttural noise coming from the heart of the deep woods. Curiosity peaked. I decided to investigate, but what I encountered was far from what I expected. As I ventured deeper into the woods, I came face to face with a massive, unknown predator. Its fur was matted and its eyes glinted with a malevolent hunger. It was unlike any animal I had ever seen before. Before I could even reach for my radio, the creature attacked. 
I fought with all my might, using every ounce of my strength and training. It was a struggle for survival, with the unknown predator intent on taking me down. I thought I was done when another park ranger found us, and then creature fled. I soon realized that what I had encountered was far more than just a wild animal. It was a dark mystery, something beyond my understanding, lurking in the heart of the park. And even now, as I look back on that fateful night, I can't help but shiver with a mix of fear and excitement. It was a cold and cloudy winter evening, and I had just woke up from a nice little power nap. I was tired as usual after every power nap, so I slowly got up and went to the kitchen to get something to eat. I got some food, heated it up, and went to go sit down and watch some YouTube. I sat down and found a video of urban legends on my home page. I was interested, so I clicked on it and watched it. It showed the usual goat man and moth man, but one urban legend caught my eye. A urban legend called the Orange Eyes. I was intrigued and watched it. The video creator said that it was a Bigfoot type creature. It was tall and had glowing orange eyes. But what I was really surprised about was it was a urban legend from my state. So after I heard that information, I searched up where it supposedly at and found that it was only a 15 minute drive from me. So like any other adventurous human, I hit up my friend and asked if he wanted to come with me and go look for it. He told me that he doesn't believe in that stuff and it was a waste of time, but I begged him and finally, after a couple of minutes, he agreed. I was really excited I got dressed and packed some flashlights because it was almost nine. After I was done packing up supplies, I got in my car and had to pick my friend up. When I got there, he didn't look too excited and said that he was tired. He got in the car and we were on our way. I told him the details and what the thing looked like, and he said that. There's no way the thing is real. I told him that it would be fun and that there's probably nothing out there. We got to the road that would take up straight to the area we could get out at to be closer to the forest entrance. While driving down the road, I couldn't help shake the feeling of being watched, but I tried to not notice the feeling and kept heading down to the entrance. We got to the entrance and I handed my buddy a flashlight because it was pitch black outside. I told him if he was ready and he said that he was good. So we start the nightmarish journey into the forest of the orange eyes. We walked for a good hour or so with nothing really happening. My buddy said that he was tired and wanted to go back home, but I told him let's stay for two more hours. He agreed and we continued walking. I couldn't shake off the feeling again of being watched. I told my friend if he felt the same way, and he said, yeah, ever since we turned onto the road that headed down here, I felt like I was being watched. We both were on edge now as we continued forward. Not too long after the feeling of being watched, we hear to our right something being snapped, like if someone or something stepped on a branch. We both jumped at the sound of it and pointed our flashlights over in the direction of the noise. But to our relief, it was just a little deer. We joked around with each other about who jumped more at the sound. We did this for a minute or two. We were in the middle of having a little argument when we heard heavy breathing coming from my left. We stopped arguing and listened closely to see if it was what we heard. We heard the heavy breathing like we thought we did. I didn't want to shine my light over there, so I tried to see if I could see anything. Thinking back to it, I wished I didn't look because what I saw would haunt me for the rest of my life. What I saw standing there behind a tree was ten-foot creature standing there with one of its eyes peering around the tree. And what shook me down to the core was that its eyes were orangish-red color. At this point, I wanted to pass out from fear, but I stopped that from happening. I looked at my buddy, and I could tell that he saw it too. I told him that we need to get out of here now before it's too late. We both agreed that we would take off at a dead sprint back to the car. I told him on three, we will go. I started to count, but I couldn't even get to two when felt a warm breath hit the back of my neck. At that point, I screamed, run. We kicked it into six gear and ran as fast as we could. As we were running, I heard the tree moving and felt the ground shaking. 
My lungs were burning from the thin, cold air. We ran for what felt like hours until we saw the car. I reached into my pocket for my car key and with one swift movement unlocked the car, opened the door, and turned the car on. I put the car in reverse so fast I felt like I could have been a stuntman for a racing movie. I hit the gas, flung the car around like an action movie. I put the car in drive and floored it down the road, never looking back once. Once we felt like we were a good distance away to ease up a bit, I asked my buddy if he was okay and he said he was fine. All I did on the drive home was think about how close the creature was to me for me to feel its breath. I dropped my buddy off and told him to be safe and take care. When I got home, I took everything off, took a shower, and went to bed. The next morning was good. I felt like the day before was just a bad dream. But I realized really soon that it was real because the backpack that I had used to carry my stuff had a big slash in it, probably from the thing or a tree branch. From when we were running away, I called my friend to check if he was all right and continued my day after. By now, I've kind of gotten over it, and my friend doesn't think of it anymore. From that experience, I don't want to go to a forest to hike or camp anymore. I hope you take something from this and learn to not be stupid like me and go out to a forest at night. Went for an afternoon hike once. At the top of the ridge line, I scrambled around a plateau of rocks to be on the other side facing another canyon and off the trail to smoke a tiny bowl. This is already a quite secluded trail. Maybe expect to see less than five people all day. It's like 12 noon and sunny. Nothing spooky slash special. Halfway through my bowl, my dog goes full Razorback, Rottweiler, Healer mix, and loses her ever-loving mind deep dark growl gets super skittish and won't go with me back around to the other side i have to go ahead first and then command her to come past some invisible barrier i think i even picked her up to get past a section of rock she refused to go past but i wasn't going the other way around since i didn't know what was there to rain or otherwise i've got goosebumps on every part of my body and my hair standing up on my arms the whole time now I'm high and adrenaline got me spooked and paranoid. Based on everything and where we are, I'm thinking mountain lion. I get back on the trail and nope the F down the mountain. Some two weeks previous, some transient teen with green hair had been reported missing in town and thought to have tried hiking with her dog, Wolfcast D. Mix, through the mountain range to a popular alpine lake on the leeward side. Her missing person poster was around town, and at the campsites down the canyon. Several days after my spook, they found her hanging from a tree just off the trail, and her wolf dog had been eating what he could reach of her leg slash torso. Don't know to this day if it was her sent to wolf dog that spooked my dog or a mountain lion, as I don't know exactly where they found her body, but it was somewhere close in the same area. But I am so glad I wasn't the one to find her. High adrenaline pumping and on edge, dog razor backed ready for war, coming around a corner to find a long green haired corpse half eaten by a dog and hanging from a tree would have been done. My wife and I were traveling to the Smoky Mountains from Ohio on an anniversary getaway. We usually avoid highways in our travels and instead prefer the scenic and slower-paced state routes of my childhood. This trip stood out as quite a disaster as we struggled with both the GPS and paper maps while navigating a route I was at least somewhat familiar with. Navigational errors are not our norm, and we quickly found ourselves having an uncharacteristic argument that got fairly heated but was nonsensical. It was like we spoke different languages and were looking at different maps. We eventually found ourselves in increasingly less populated areas and poorer road conditions. For those not familiar with the area being in central Kentucky, the forest is hilly and expansive, dotted with small towns and the occasional privately owned farm amidst all the federal land. We had eventually quieted down, 
anxiously following the GPS as it cut in and out. Our anxiety grew until the GPS suddenly chimed in with turn left now. I responded by reluctantly starting the turn when my wife suggested it must be a shortcut we were unaware of. Upon completing the turn, I slowed. Seeing the road took a sudden drop in quality. Potholes large enough to get a tire stuck in. Overgrown scrub growth on the edges and ominous gnarled vines hanging down. The hair stood up on my neck as it still does right now as I write it. Bringing the car to a stop, I asked my wife, are you sure about this? As I look towards her, no, we need to turn around, she starts to say, but is cut off, almost frozen, staring at her phone. Not in the way a person freezes when terror sends their muscles trembling, but completely motionless. I instinctively slam it in reverse. Backing into the position, we came so that I could continue the course we were on. As we reached the end of our reverse turn, I slammed it into drive, but went nowhere as the rear of the early 2000s Lincoln is lifted off the ground. Before I can process what is happening, something charged from the woods to our right. At first, it was a large red blob that moved with a speed and grace that seemed unnatural to its grotesque nature. As it closed the gap, it was clear that it was running on all fours, but only partly so. Its forward movement agile but uneven as it irregularly used its arms with its oddly bent hind legs. It was almost like its limbs were growing as it eventually came to stand on its hind legs and place its hands on the glass. Up close I could see what I thought was fur seemed more like strands of rotten flesh that grew as thick as a shaggy dog and smelled overwhelmingly of rotten fish and moss. Its hands looked nearly human, were it not for the rotten fur and long claws. The face sticks with me as much as the smell, being somewhat shaped like a human that has its face twisted and pulled forward in vague canine shape, with large pointed ears toward the top of its head. Inside its snarling mouth were long, narrow teeth that looked almost too large to close. But the eyes were the worst part, bloodshot and yellow. They leered at my wife with a hunger, the kind of hunger that promises unspeakable things. When you're in a flight or fight situation, you usually get that distinct moment of clarity where you make your choice, even if it's one you're ashamed of. In that moment, I felt like a small dog defending my mate from a rabid wolf. I stomped the gas pedal and bellowed hard, go now, and a series of loud noises that sounded more like barks than human noises. It jolted suddenly and the rear of the car drops leading to a loud peal out. It kept pace with us, scratching at the car and banging on it until we broke 45 miles per hour, driving wildly through the winding country until we saw the lights of a town in the distance. We parked in a well-lit parking lot in the center of town next to a gas station. We busied ourselves as we inspected the car, reluctantly sharing what we thought we saw. She was in tears and sobbing about feeling a pressure in her head, and that she was conscious but paralyzed. Looking into the trunk, I spotted a cracked strut and a lump of the rotten flesh dangling from a frame member. The smell was still overpowering and sent us into a tear-filled hug as we stared at a piece of the filthy creature and realized it was likely at least two of them. The one in the window and the one that lifted the rear axle of the ground. Thoroughly shaken, we sat in the car facing opposite directions and discreetly unpacked our handguns and hid them under our blanket. We waited until nine or so before setting back off towards our destination via highway. On June 4, 2001, I stopped at a beach north of Brookings, Oregon for my usual evening walk with my golden retriever. When we crossed the creek near where it empties into the ocean, to get to the north and rugged end of the beach, my dog, who normally runs a block ahead of me, froze. She did not wish to walk anywhere in this area. We turned around and took a walk on the south beach. At 7.15 p.m., heading up the path to the parking lot, I happened to glance up at the steep hills on the north. I was stunned to see what appeared to be two very large men, both dressed completely in black. 
I looked again to determine if they were a threat to me, and saw they were, in fact, covered in black, and it probably wasn't dark clothing. The figures walked in a hunched-over posture, one right in front of the other, arms swinging like apes, and taking very long strides. They seemed to see me and appeared to be coming toward me. I started to run to my Chevy Blazer. Partway there, I turned to see if I was being pursued, only to make eye contact with a large doe, perhaps less than 100 feet away. I did a 14er hike in October. I had a pair of combat boots, but they were summer boots and had very poor traction on ice. I knew this, so I went out and bought some yak tracks for the hike. They were absolute shit. They got snow stuck to them, so instead of my boots being rubber on ice, were ice on ice. In the whole hike, I slipped and fell 50 to 100 times. The yak tracks even began to fall apart a few miles in. By the time I got to around 13,000 feet, I noticed one was gone. That left me high in the snowy mountains with extra slippery boots. With the hardest part over, I made it to the summit. Then I had to descend with slippery boots and what was left of the yak track on one boot. I had to zigzag down a steep drop while following some footsteps of previous hikers. One slip in the wrong direction and I wasn't stopping for a long ways. I'm a 32-year-old lady from the very northern tip of West Virginia. Most of my life has been lived in Hancock County. When I was little, we camped in tents, walked everywhere, hiked at parks. All that outside goodness. In my teens, we started going to state parks to ride horses. I have been to Thomason Run, Beaver Creek State Park, Salt Fork, Raccoon Creek, and Vista Park. I think that was the name. We had a friend who was constantly inviting us to ride on people's land she had received permission from. I'm well acquainted with the local wildlife. I've seen all the major players, including coy dogs and bears, and can identify most sounds in the forest. I love watching nature documentaries. I was looking to become a vet, so I studied a lot on animals. Drawing and painting them got me very acquainted with animal anatomy. Was I ever into cryptozoology? Yes, I was a dino-crazy little girl. My one babysitter had Reader's Digest Mysteries of the Unexplained. The thought of a plesiosaur in Scotland or an apatosaurus in the Congo was just mind-blowing. Later in life, I started looking at it like folklore. It was interesting to read the accounts and learn the theories behind what people were seeing. But I believed in them as much as a folklorist believes in dragons and trolls. I didn't have any interest in Bigfoot, and I'd never heard of Dogman. I never had interest in looking, nor did the thoughts ever cross my mind. It seems I didn't need to go looking. They found me. We moved to the farm when I was about ten. Mom's dream was to have horses, and she was finally able to live it. The farmhouse was haunted, mainly by the former residents of the house. I never felt threatened by them, though. It's a little unnerving to have two men talking and moving the couch you're sitting on. Or should I say it sounded like it? No one was home. No media was on. And yet I was hearing two men talking about how they were going to move the couch and where, and the sound of furniture being dragged right from under me. The land itself had its share of strangeness. Most things were benign, though. We just shrugged and carried on. I honestly hated our woods. Anywhere else, I'd freely hike. But even in the yard, sometimes I felt watched. Heck, sometimes I thought something was staring in our windows. Now that I think of it, we did have things slam into our trailer. I'd think it was a horse that had gotten loose. But when I'd go out to investigate, I'd find nothing. I'd chalk it up to a deer. I used my horse's breeds for their names rather than think up names for them. Anyone who knows me knew my horse's names. I was 18 to 19 in this encounter. By this time, we gave up on cows. I hate, hate them, and just had the horses and chickens. Someone knocked on the door at 2 a.m. 
I'd only been asleep two hours, but years of conditioning had my heart pumping and my mind clearing. Someone knocking that early meant trouble. It usually meant horses or livestock had gotten out. I wasn't disappointed. Our neighbor said the horses were in his yard. My mind wasn't totally awake, so I didn't think to ask which yard they were in. My stepfather came out, asked what was up, and told me they were my horses, so deal with it. Mom was working. That was nothing new. This lot of horses had three expert escape artists. I had the routine down. It was pretty dark out, but I did have some moonlight to help. The security light only went so far. Then, of course, it shut off after so long. When it was cloudy, you literally had to watch that you didn't walk off into the ravine. It was so pitch. I was naturally in a foul mood, cursing my horses and wondering if some drunk had gone through the fence. Again, it happened a lot. As I got closer to the brown barn, I realized a horse was flipping out. It was running back and forth, squealing and carrying on. I went in and grabbed the halters and leads. I paused for a moment to see if any other horse or horses had replied to the horse as I heard squeal. That would give me an idea where the other horse or horses might be. There was no reply. That was odd. I was thinking, crap, they're on the other side of the hill. It was the only reason in my mind they wouldn't be replying. Let's just say when they followed our cut trails to the other side, it took us an hour to traverse through the woods and lead them back. And even with two guys on a four-wheeler and my mom, that was a freaky trek. I felt like I was being watched and followed. Maybe it wasn't paranoia, so... The land is set up like this. The brown barn was connected to a small pasture, about half an acre long, which then connects to a seven-acre pasture. Pretty much in the center, on the outside edge of the large pasture, was an old white barn that we turned into a run-in. I decided to tackle the horse still in the fence so I could bring her down to the small pasture to keep her from escaping, too. Maybe the others would follow. I had to walk clear to the other side of the pasture to get to the panicking horse. It was my mother's psycho Appaloosa mare. I tried to catch her and nearly got trampled a few times trying. She was frothing at the mouth and her eye whites were really showing. Was I alarmed? No, I, as I said, psycho. I noticed my other six were across the road. They were standing in a tiny little fence, an area under a spotlight. They were standing motionless and not touching a blade of grass. I was wondering how the neighbor managed to herd them into that tiny fenced-in area with that tiny door. Three of those horses were over 16 hands tall. One was a draft horse cross. The doorway was actually small enough. He touched both sides going through. My thoroughbred mare took me two hours to corral. The last time she got out, much to my frustration, she was an awesome jumper. So a stranger rounding them up and putting them into a tiny yard was mind-blowing. I've had horses since I was nine. I'm 32 now. I've had ponies and horses. I've had Appaloosas, Arabians, draft horses, quarter horses, saddlebreds, thoroughbreds, mustangs, foals, geldings, that still thought they were stallions. I've had a lot of horses from all walks of life. I will tell you, they consistently do not like to be crammed into tight spaces, especially not in a group. I had two severely abused horses I was rehabbing, a thoroughbred that actually had PTSD, and a racking horse that actually took me three years to touch without some sort of a bad reaction. They did not like being in stalls, and all but one were mares. Maras are extremely moody, and two of mine were particularly vicious. To those they didn't like, my walker mare only liked three other horses. She should have been kicking the crap out of the others there. Man also didn't like to be under lights when they escaped. They avoided them like the plague. And not eating grass. That was over ankle deep. That was unheard of. They were silent and dead still. My neighbor came out and told me that they were like that when he found them. He asked me if I needed help, but I said no. My thoroughbred and racking horse mares did not like men. I told him I'd take them out, one at a time. I took one halter and lead and threw the rest outside the gate. I put the halter on my gilding and opened the gate to lead him out. 
They had other plans, though. All six came out as a freaking unit. They were literally chest to butt crammed together. My gelding and my Welsh mare had their chest pushing against me as we walked back to the brown barn. Normally, they did not do this. I wouldn't usually allow such bad behavior. We were on the main road, which I did not like. The speed limit is only 35, but people go 60. So I tried to lead them through the large pasture gate. They wouldn't even go on that side of the road, though. I was a little unnerved by their behavior. So I lead them down to the brown barn, and they went in. They were skittish, though, picking at the hay I threw out, walking around restlessly, sticking to the barn-like blue, and eyeing the upper pasture. I rationalize it by thinking, it's the atty flipping out that's unnerving them. And why hadn't she come down yet? She had to have seen us all walk down. I rushed to the gate between the little and big pastures out of habit. I didn't want the herd to go back out into the big pasture. I didn't have to worry. They didn't follow me like they usually did. The gate was wide open, but the appy was still running and squealing back and forth in the same area. I started to go get her. Now the neighbor's security lights didn't really light up my pasture. The road was higher than my pasture, so it was cast in a shadow. I could make out her shape in some detail, though. She took off at a panic gallop, swerved sideways, and jumped the stream. When she landed, she nearly landed on her face. She caught herself, though, and took off at a dead gallop again. I ducked behind the stump. If she would have hit me, I would have been dead. I went back and chained the gate. I decided to forego looking her over until I got the halters and leads. She was too hot at the moment. I decided to walk on the road instead of through the pasture again. The pasture was uneven, unlit, and full of springs. Sometime during this, clouds had taken over the sky, so there was no moonlight to see by. The spot on the road where I was at was paved and pretty well lit, though my neighbor was paranoid as mentioned. I had almost gotten to the white barn when I got this sudden urge to stop and look at a very specific spot in the pasture. I would like to say it was instinct that told me to look, but usually I'd scan the woods first to see what was watching me. That's usually where the watchers are. Instead, I just flicked on my flashlight right on a certain spot. It was extremely close to where the mare was flipping out. I saw red eyes shine. My first thought was, why in the world would a deer be there with all that chaos? I was feeling a sense of extreme dread and didn't know why. Besides, it being where my horse was going nuts told me something else just wasn't right. I then realized where the eyes were relative to the walnut trees and my racing barrels. See, the road is above the pasture and the walnut trees were right at the same elevation as the road. The pasture itself is sloped to deal with the runoff from the road. The barrel it was next to was on the low end of the incline. The barrels were white, so I could see a dim lighting from my flashlight on the one it was next to. This thing was too freaking big to be a deer. I was frozen, standing there, watching it. I just had this feeling. It was evil, and that I had to keep track of those eyes. It was watching me. It slowly blinked a few times. It also looked over into the woods above the pasture. I know you ask your guests if they ever feel there are other ones out there. Well, let me tell you, it, it crossed my mind. With a sinking stomach, I flashed my flashlight over the woods to see if I would catch eye shine. I didn't see any, though, so I went right back to the eyes. They were still there. I flicked back and forth, making sure nothing was sneaking up on me. I don't know how long I stood there watching Frozen. Someone could have come around the bend and hit me with their car. I was so focused. Finally, it started to move off. It glanced at me sideways a few times, only one eye. I think it went into the copse of trees around the creek. I heard nothing. That wasn't surprising, though. The horses were still restless and making noises. I stood there a long time after, looking for eye shine. I was wondering if it could have been a bear. I didn't think so, though. The eyes were consistent in height until it disappeared. Bears are clumsy on their back legs.
on this uneven, inclined ground, I have no doubt a bear would have dropped to the ground to go on all fours. Even the rear up and drop down behavior bears do when they're trying to see something wouldn't work. We had one cross our pasture before. He made a lot of noise going through the woods. The horses settled down quicker with the bear. I was almost to my neighbors at this point. I considered leaving the couple hundred dollars of tack at his house. Halters and leads aren't cheap. I had no doubt if I left them there, they'd be gone in the morning. My mother would be pissed. So I darted over, grabbed them, and ran like a bat out of hell. I know, I know, I should have left the tack. I also know you're not supposed to run, but I couldn't even conceive what I had just seen. I got into the barn, threw the tack down, and hung with the horses. I wasn't going to go back up that pitch black driveway on foot. I figured with the horses I'd have a warning and the barn had plenty of sharp things. I didn't go back up until dawn. I was frozen stiff by that time. I've had years to think this over. It unnerves the crap out of me. How long was that thing there? Was that what was keeping the appy mare from coming down? Was it right there in the shadows while I was trying to catch her, or was it in the unlit barn? I walked through to get to the road. Was it the reason the epi swerved and nearly fell? How did my horses get out? I never did find how they got out. Did they panic and jump the fence? I did check the fence line away from the woods. I did look for tracks around the barrel. Sadly, the ground was hard from frost that morning. But I will say the appy mare was running for a good while. The ground was severely torn up and turned into a muddy mess. It was high noon when I went down there to check, and the ground had melted. I'll bet it was her that woke the neighbor up. It took them about a week to fully settle. I don't know if whatever it was was still in the area, or if they were that traumatized. It wasn't too long after that my mother filed for divorce. My ex-stepfather got the farm and I moved in with her in the city. Even with all of the weird crap going on there, there were none. Bipedal things going on, too. I miss it terribly. Maybe it's more accurate to say I miss the farm life rather than the actual place. I'd love to get back onto a farm again, but I'd probably hesitate to move back there. I never told anyone about the Ashine event. I didn't see the actual creature, and really, uh, how do you convey that unnatural horror-inducing feeling? You saw I shine whoop dee do. My mother would have given me the benefit of the doubt, but my mother often told family members things. They made my life enough of a living hell. I didn't want to give them more ammo. This actually happened. I'm serious. The only reason why I even tell people is because my friend saw it with me and we still talk about it to this day. B-16 or 17 friend came by to tutor me in calculus about 10 p. me at night. I let my friend drive my car to his house. He lived out in the outskirts of town where there's nothing but orchards of almonds. Passed by cattle ranch with lots of lights. Silence in the car. I'm on shotgun and I see a bull running on its two legs like a human. Bull turns its head towards us. Red glowing eyes, bull looks like it's getting ready to spin around, but then evaporates. Look towards my friend and ask him, did you see that? My friend replies, did it look like a bull running on two legs with red glowing eyes and then it disappeared? Yes, I saw that. Photo F that was about ten years ago. My coper came in his day off just to tell me that his friend saw the exact same thing six years after the incident. My ex didn't see anything was on cell phone. 100% true story. Roller coaster. Appalachian Trail. Nobody else at the shelter. Woke up early in the a.m. Watch it died. Used a stick to tell the time. But daylight savings are no. So I knew it was between 7 and 9 a.m. Started hiking out because my daughter was picking me up that day at a predetermined location. I didn't pass or see anyone that whole day. I started thinking I hadn't seen anyone the day prior either. 
and that didn't seem normal because the roller coaster section had been pretty well traveled. Anywho, my mind started messing with me, and I started to think that an emergency had happened in the world, and I was the only one left. Kept thinking I had to be close to the rendezvous point. Where is it, map? Gotta be close. Where is it? Then I hear a car horn way up the mountain beep three times. So I scramble for my whistle in three short bursts in response. I hear my daughter scream, Mom! And I look up, and she is running down the mountain, screaming, crying. I was late by five or six hours, and she was terrified. I broke down and bought a cell phone after that. This was about six years ago, so I held out pretty long anti-consumer. I think I just way overslept and mind screwed myself. I was glad to have a cell phone on subsequent hikes, even if it didn't work everywhere. Made me feel a bit safer about being a solo female traveler and gave my daughter peace of mind while I was gone. So I live in the rurals of Indiana, U.S. It's pretty stereotypical, a gravel road surrounded by cornfields, all that. It gets pretty spooky at times. Cornfields are creepy at night, and it always sounds like something is running through them. Dark, twisting shadows from trees in our yard. Occasionally weird animal calls. Yada, yada, yada. One time I forgot to feed the outside dogs during the afternoon, so I had to go out back and feed them, even though it was dark out. When I turned around, I, I swear I saw a figure lumber over the peak of the roof behind the chimney like it was hiding from me. It terrified me, and I sprinted back inside, which actually felt more scary considering I was running the direction of the thing I just thought I saw. But the real story comes from a few weeks before, and why that fleeting thought scared me so bad. So bit of backstory, my dog can best be described as a punk. He's a miniature schnauzer, but he thinks he's big and scary. He is fearless to a pretty stupid degree. We had a pack of coyotes walk through our empty field, and I had to sprint and tackle him to stop him from confronting the entire pack, growling and barking the whole way. Same story when he escaped the fence and went for a nearby neighbor's two angry boxers. So animals don't scare my stupid dog, and as I mentioned, he had gotten in the habit of escaping his fence. So one night, it's like 3 a.m., and he wakes me up and is whining and groaning and clearly has to go outside. Well, he had been escaping and I hadn't fixed the fence, so I hooked a leash on him and went outside. The motion light came on and I could see it's insanely foggy. The fog was so thick I could barely see the car in the drive, maybe 30 feet from where I was standing. So I was a little unsettled, but I take him out and he does his business and he starts sniffing around. And he kind of was whining, like he was smelling something weird, and he started circling and being agitated. Well, I thought I'd walk him through the yard to calm him down so I could go back to sleep. Well, like I said, he has never been scared of another animal, and his response to seeing anything is run up to it barking. But he stopped and focused hard, and his breathing started going really fast. But he was standing close by me, not pulling on the leash. I followed his gaze and I saw this dark figure, bigger than a person, lumbering across the yard. It almost looked like a large person hunched over, maybe on four legs. Maybe not, bear-sized, but I've never ever seen a bear anywhere near here. Cornfields and towns between two cities is where I live. No bears. The fact that he was clearly scared and didn't want to engage this thing, mixed with I couldn't tell what it was at all. I ran back inside, and he very happily followed, and he sat down once inside and just looked up at me, whining, like he was scared. Single most terrifying experience of my life. I was hiking miles deep into the backcountry valleys and the Society Islands when I came across a cabin that was 90% completed but the tools and generator and everything was still there. Only everything was covered in vines as if the builder had suddenly stopped for a lunch break and hadn't returned for years. Even a small radio with the on switch still on sat on a nightstand with the batteries and metal components rusting out. 
Next to it was a fantastic antique pocket knife that I decided to keep, passing up on the thousands of dollars of tools and other valuables. As I made my way back towards the single track path, I entered a clearing and was immediately circled by two wild dogs. They were greasy, dark black with wild yellow eyes and vicious, snarling teeth. I flipped out the knife as they began to lunge toward me, making small doves toward my legs. I swiped at one and aggressively stomped toward the other. This continued for twenty, thirty seconds, but felt like an eternity. Soon they slowly retreated as I became more and more pumped with adrenaline, making actual attempts to stab them by now. I yelled as loud as I could and stomped even more, and they finally retreated and scattered into the jungle. We heard three loud whoops and a howl, almost like a dog, but different. None of our dogs barked, but were very still and quiet, which is unusual. The pattern repeated itself with variations for about two minutes. We thought it might be drunk graduates at first, but our friend who had left for a midnight four-wheel drive said no one was camped above us on the mountain. The next night, all the others in camp heard loud screams, but I was dead asleep. There were five children and four adults in camp both nights. We looked in the meadow and along the creek that runs through our camp spot, but never found any signs. Then again, we did not know what to look for besides footprints. None of us have ever heard the noises before, and some of us have been in the woods, camping frequently since childhood. We are all in our mid-thirties. We had all went to bed about two, three hours earlier after just talking around the campfire. We put all the kids to bed about 9.30 p.m. It was so loud it woke the kids up. It sounded very close. Out hiking the Wonderland Trail in 2012, my trail mate and I had an encounter with a rather standoffish park ranger who questioned us to a severe degree. After answering her questions to her satisfaction, she relaxed and informed us that there was a killer on the mountain, and they were trying to hunt this guy down. He'd already killed a park ranger and had taken food and supplies from other hikers. We had no idea this had been going on. The next few nights were sleepless. We never saw the guy, but we also have no idea if maybe he'd seen us. I went to Paradise on Mount Rainer and took a little butt of shrooms. I walked up to Panorama Point and just suddenly felt freezing cold, so I walked back down and made it back to my car. During the busy season, overflow, parking for Paradise, goes to the picnic area. I was not capable of driving for about another hour. I opened Netflix and was going to watch some trailer park boys. There was a large family of about 40 Middle Eastern people having a picnic in front of my car, and the kids were running in, between the cars and playing. They kept putting their fingers where the door ends and the driver's side glass starts and peeking into my car and giggling and running away. Needless to say, I had to get out of there, so I took my bag and walked to a quiet spot and set up the hammock and watched the sunset. I was hiking alone once and on my way back after a peaceful and pleasant day when I just hit a wall. I wasn't tired, it was pure dread, like I was being watched and suddenly had a sense of not making progress, like my car, the trailhead were no longer there. Also started to feel like if I stopped I would hear or see something that I wasn't supposed to, and the smell was just off. There is this certain smell in the northeast woods sometimes that smells like rotting uh, fermentation of plant matter. I want to say it's cattails maybe, but I don't think that's it. It's really hard to describe other than it's very distinct and sort of comes out of nowhere, especially in the summer and when the wood feel quiet. It's always made me afraid for some reason, which sounds stupid, but the smell just takes over everything and feels wrong like the normal, natural plants smell off because they are decomposing around a body.
I was in the Mission Mountains in Montana hiking to a lake and not even a quarter mile in. I heard something in front of me. I looked up and saw the biggest brown ball I've seen. Lucky it was running away. You could hear this beast feet hitting the ground, thundering through the forest. I'm almost certain it could have been a grizzly because I saw a black bear in the area the day before and was no comparison to size. So anyway, I carried on to Lucifer Lake, and on my way back, walking in the dark, there was another animal that I could not see, but ran across the trail behind me and stopped under a tree. I could hear it rustling around, all aggressively, and stop, and I could tell it was just staring at me in the dark. So I pulled the trusty point, 357, and bear spray out, and got the F out of there. This was my first time to the lake, and was by myself. Twenty fifteen. I was packing up camp in the Catalinas east of Tucson an hour or so after dark and all of a sudden the sky lights up and about one third of my field of view looking up was bright. It kind of seemed like there was a projectile at the center, but it was hard to tell what I was seeing. No cell service, so we weren't sure if Phoenix had been nuked or what else may have happened. It turned out to be a Titan. Missile launched from a submarine off the coast of California and it was very lightly reported at the time, and none of the scant few videos I've found, even ones filmed from California, no justice to what I saw. We weren't full-on panicked about what it was, but it was very unsettling to see. 'Cause as a child in Wyoming, playing in a creek bed with my sisters and heard rustling in the bushes on the bank directly across from us. We look up just as a baby moose pokes its head out. We were savvy enough to know Mom was nearby, and a breath later she too pokes her head out of the bushes. She was so big, leaning out of the bushes, her neck and head spanned the creek bed. I do not remember running for the car, but my mom says she turned around to see what the fuss was, and all four of us and our dogs were back in the truck. Wonderful experience. Mom, Moose, and Baby were beautiful. But the mother was also huge and terrifying. I think my heart stopped until we were back in the car. <laughs> It happened in July of 2012 while I'm off with my boyfriend on vacation. He inherited a small house on an island in Brittany, France. It's called Isle de Grox. It's situated a few kilometers off the south coast of Brittany, and you can only get there with a ferry. It is pretty small, and only a few inhabitants live there all year long. There's not much to do, but it's really beautiful, and it's a nice place for quiet vacation. We like to go for rides during daytime as well as nighttime. Now, I'll start telling my story. 100% true. So one night, a clear night night doused in moonlight. It's important to remember that. We went out around midnight for a ride on the island as we were used to do so. We headed to a beach whose name I can't remember that goes along a small family vacation village, VVF. Quick description of the area. The VVF is situated in a big curve bordered by a small road. Alongside the road is a strip of grass and sand. When standing on this strip, you have a really nice view of the beach and the sea which lie below. The road and village are situated on some kind of a steep cliff. To go down to the beach, you have to walk down sheer narrow stairs, situated a few meters away from where we were standing. Kay, my boyfriend, and I were standing by the road on the strip of sand grass since like ten minutes, looking down at the sea. I need to point out that it was a calm, clear night, and we hadn't seen anyone during our ride. We were walking along the beach for a while and hadn't noticed anything strange, nor signs of human presence on the beach. No night swimmers. The water is very cold in Brittany, even in the summer. No young people having a party on the beach, etc., so we were standing on a cliff facing the sea when suddenly straight ahead of us we saw a human-shaped figure get out of the water and hurry across the beach. I know, it's nothing scary so far. Except the figure was pitch black contrasting with the clear sand and was not reflecting any light like a dark shadow. It's weird cause. 
remember the moon was shining. We first thought it was someone skinny dipping. Problem is, when you're going out of sea, you first swim to the edge of the sea. Then you stand up and walk out of the water. This figure gradually went out all the time standing tall as if it was walking on the bottom of the ocean. Moreover, Kay and I had been looking at the water for a while and never noticed anyone swimming, as if it was totally emerged for at least ten minutes. At the sight of that, I felt particularly uncomfortable, not to say really freaked out. So was my boyfriend, who is not easily scared. Weirdest part is once the human-shaped figure got out of the water, it headed straight ahead to the foot of the cliff where we were standing. But it wasn't walking or running. It was sliding on the sand, like really fast. A pitch black human shape, with indistinguishable face and features, sliding fast as if on the sand, almost gliding, not moving its legs or anything, leaving no trail or footsteps behind, all the time standing tall and human, shaped average human sized and built. We stared at it silently until it got a few meters away from the foot of the cliff. Then without talking we decided to get the F out of Dodge. Still with this feeling of dread and fear. We never saw or heard of this creature again and nothing strange happened during the rest of our vacation. My boyfriend however has witnessed strange things on the island before. But nothing that's related to this story. I've always been fascinated by Yellowstone National Park. The sprawling wilderness dotted with hot springs and geysers is like nowhere else on earth. It's a place of natural beauty and wonder, but also a place of secrets and darkness. I was a park ranger in Yellowstone, tasked with ensuring the safety of all who entered its boundaries. One day I received a report of a missing camper. His friends had gone searching for him, but to no avail. It was my job to pick up the search and bring him back safely. As I ventured into the dense forests of the park, a sense of unease washed over me. The trees seemed to close in on me, blocking out the sunlight. I had a feeling that something was watching me, waiting for the right moment to strike. I pushed on, following the trail left by the missing camper. The deeper I went, the more disturbing the signs became. Broken branches, shredded clothing, and pools of blood dotted the path. And then I found him. The missing camper was lying on the ground, his body torn apart by some unknown beast. The sight was enough to make me nauseous, but I knew I had to investigate further. That's when I heard it. The sound of footsteps, not human, but something else. Something big and dangerous. I turned around, my hand reaching for my weapon, but it was too late. The creature attacked its jaws snapping at my flesh. I don't remember much after that. When I woke up, I was in an old cabin deep in the woods. I was being tended to by a woman who claimed to be a member of a secret religious order tasked with protecting the world from the supernatural. She told me that the creature that had attacked me was a werewolf, one of the many things that the government wanted to keep secret. The Secret Service was aware of the supernatural creatures roaming the park and had assigned her to protect the public from the truth. But as the days passed, I realized that the woman was not who she claimed to be. She was working for the very creatures she was supposed to be stopping, and her true intention was to use me as bait to draw more people into their grasp. I was horrified and scared, but I knew I had to escape. I made a break for it in the dead of night, but the werewolf was hot on my heels. I ran as fast as I could, but the creature caught up to me, its claws tearing into my flesh. I don't know how I managed to survive, but I did. I stumbled out of the woods, my body battered and broken. I was taken to the hospital, but I never fully recovered. I was forever scarred, both physically and mentally, by my experience in Yellowstone National Park. The Secret Service tried to cover up what had happened to me, but the truth leaked out. People began to whisper about the werewolves in the park, and the government was forced to admit to their existence. But for me, the truth came too late. I was forever changed by my encounter with the supernatural, and I could never shake the feeling that I was being watched. The end of my story is tragic, but the terror of what happened in Yellowstone National Park still lives on.
The Appalachian Mountains rise tall and proud with their rugged peaks and dense forests that stretch as far as the eye can see. As a park ranger and a native of the area, I was no stranger to the beauty and majesty of the mountains. But even I was not prepared for what I encountered one fateful night. I received a distress call from my tribe who were residing deep within the Appalachian woods. They told me that something strange was happening in the forest and that they needed my help. I immediately set out to investigate, knowing that the safety of my tribe was at stake. As I approached the reservation, I was struck by the beauty of the forest. The towering trees loomed over me, casting dappled shadows on the forest floor. The sound of rustling leaves and rushing water filled the air, and I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe and reverence for the land. But my sense of wonder was short-lived as I was patrolling the reservation, I was suddenly attacked by an unknown predator. It was a monster unlike anything I'd ever seen before. Its eyes were wild and its howls echoed through the forest. It was a wendigo, a spirit of the northern forests that was said to drive people mad with hunger. I fought back with all my strength, but the wendigo was too powerful. I managed to wound it, but it disappeared into the forest before I could finish it off. I was left confused and disoriented, struggling to make sense of what had just happened. Eventually, my tribe found me, and I told them what had transpired in the forest. They were shocked and frightened by my story, and they feared that the Wendigo would return. But I was determined to protect my tribe, and the next day I set out into the forest once again, this time armed with preparation. I knew that the conflict with the Wendigo was not over. But I was ready for the challenge. I knew that the safety of my tribe and the balance of the forest were at stake, and I was determined to put an end to the terror of the Wendigo once and for all. Again, as I entered the forest, I felt a strange sense of calm wash over me. I knew that I was not alone, that my ancestors were with me, guiding me towards the Wendigo. The sound of rustling leaves grew louder, and out of nowhere he appeared in front of me. I soon found myself facing the monster once again. This time I was ready. I called upon the spirits of the land and reached for a twelve-gauge. An exciting feeling surged through my body. The Wendigo howled in rage as it felt the bullet go through its thick skin. Unfortunately, it lunged at me with its razor-sharp claws. Our battle was intense, and the forest shook with the fury of our fight. The Wendigo was strong, but I was stronger. I could feel the power of my ancestors flowing through me, and I knew that I was going to win. With one final bullet, I defeated the Wendigo, and he just turned over and ran. The forest grew quiet, and I felt a sense of peace settle over the land. The balance had been restored, and my tribe was safe once again. I returned to the reservation, where my tribe was waiting for me. They welcomed me with open arms, and I could see the relief in their eyes. They knew that I had saved them from the Wendigo, and they were grateful. From that day on, I was known as the protector of the Appalachian woods, and my tribe held me in high esteem. I learned that the magic of the land was powerful, and that it was our duty to respect and protect it so that future generations could enjoy the beauty and majesty of the mountains. I am John, an African-American park ranger stationed in the remote mountains of the Appalachian Trail. My job was to patrol the vast wilderness and make sure that everyone who entered it, hiker, camper, or otherwise, was safe and secure. It was a warm summer day, and I was on my usual rounds when I stumbled upon something that would change my life forever. I was following a trail of broken branches and torn shrubs when I heard a loud roar in the distance. I thought it was a bear at first, but when I reached the source of the noise, I was faced with something far more terrifying. It was a Bigfoot, a massive bipedal creature covered in fur, standing at least ten feet tall. I had heard stories of these creatures before, but I'd never believed they were real, but there it was right in front of me and it was angry. I was frozen in fear, but I managed to draw my sidearm and take a shot at the creature.
It didn't even flinch, and I soon realized that bullets were not going to be enough to stop it. The Bigfoot charged at me, and I ran as fast as I could. I stumbled upon a cave and crawled inside, hoping that the Bigfoot wouldn't be able to fit through the entrance. But to my horror, it was able to squeeze inside, and I was trapped. The Bigfoot began to tear through the cave, looking for me, and I was running out of options. That's when I remembered the stories that my grandfather used to tell me about the Native American spirits that lived in these woods. I started to pray to them, begging for their help, and, and that's when I heard a voice. It was soft at first, but it grew louder and more insistent until it was a roar. The Bigfoot was thrown back from the cave entrance, and I was able to escape. I never saw the creature again, but I knew that it was still out there waiting for its next victim. I soon found out that there were other people in these woods and that they were searching for something. They were a secret service, investigating a series of strange and paranormal occurrences. They thought that I knew something and they started to follow me, always watching me, always waiting for me to slip up. I was in over my head and I didn't know who to trust, but I knew one thing for sure, I'm quitting my job. The pay is not worth the trouble if fighting various cryptids in woods. This takes place in March, April of 2013. Me and a friend had just been to the movies and was just walking around at 10, 45 p.m. We decided we would take a shortcut through the skewer of our old school, which had since been abandoned and was in pretty bad shape. As we walked through the schoolyard, we decided to try to get inside the school building and explore a little bit. Now, the school consists of two wings, so the building is an L shape if viewed from above. It is three stories tall and has three entrances. The main entrance leads into a kind of main hall which connects the two wings. Each wing has staircases and each end of the corridors which lead to the different floors. This is important later. One of the windows right by the entrance to the lower wing was actually wide open, so we could easily get in. We were now in the basement. We used our cell phones as flashlights and made sure not to point them towards the windows to avoid being seen. Even though the building was not in use, there was still a lot of stuff deaf just laying around. Musical equipment, uniforms, a pool table, chairs, etc. So we were just exploring each room in the basement to see if we could find anything cool. We explored the basement for about 15 minutes before we headed up to the first floor, and we were now in the main hall. There was some kind of tarp or large plastic sheet hanging there to separate the hall and the lower wing for some reason. I assume it was for some kind of construction work. We went down one of the corridors and started exploring the classrooms. Every classroom had been either vandalized or suffered some kind of water damage, so everything was pretty broken down and rotting. In hindsight, I think we were lucky the floors didn't collapse on us or something. We had just come out of the third classroom and were in the corridor when we heard someone moving the tarp, plastic sheet in the main hall. This was not wind or anything. We could definitely tell someone was physically moving it. We could also hear footsteps although the rhythm of the steps was kind of weird. It sounded like someone changed their walking pace sporadically, if that makes any sense. We immediately went inside a classroom to hide, as we thought someone had called security on us. We hid behind the door in the classroom for about two minutes, dead quiet. We didn't hear anything else during this time, so we figured it had to be the wind or just random noises. We decided to keep going. We went through the corridor and up the stairs in the other end from the main hall and explored the second floor. While we were there, we would occasionally hear some noises, but we just brushed it off as wind. After a while, we had explored the rest of the corridor and we decided to walk down the staircase that lead from the second floor to the hall. Halfway down the staircase, there was this plateau before the second set of stairs. And this is where things took a turn, no pun intended. We could see the plastic from there, and it was moving. We also heard some kind of scratching noise. We stood there for a second just listening, and I decided to peek around the corner to see what was making that sound. What I saw scared the living shit out of me. It was some kind of creature. It was skinny, almost completely naked. 
couldn't see any clothes, at least. It really thin strands of hair and was really pale. Like corpse, pale, almost completely white. The first thing that came to mind was that this thing looked like Gollum, just bigger. It was crouching down and was scratching the floor or something, and it made some weird, growly, growly, grunny, breathy noises. It was facing away from us, so I just stood frozen for a good while and watched it. I took a step back and just pointed at this thing and looked at my friend. He peeked around the corner, and immediately I could see his facial expression change into a combination of horror and shock. It was reassuring in a way, knowing that he saw it too. We just stood there for a good twenty seconds, just watching this thing do whatever it was doing, and the most cliché horror movie thing happened. My friend started backing away slowly, and while doing so, stepped on a piece of glass that cracked. This startled the creature, and it quickly looked over its shoulder right at me. I just bolted at that point. We ran all the way to the basement to get out, and the whole way there I swear it felt like it was right behind us. We ran back to my friend's house, and when we got there we had a kind of debriefing session, making sure we both saw the same thing. The closest thing to a reference picture I can find is this. It pretty much looked exactly like that, just with thin strands of hair on its head. I understand if you think I'm bullshitting, I would be skeptical if someone else told this story, but I swear this actually happened and my friend confirms it to this day. We got a good enough look at it to confirm that it was a humanoid creature of some sorts, but it didn't really resemble a human being. The only explanation I can think of is that it was a homeless dude that for some reason was naked in this abandoned school. But this is in northern Norway during winter. You wouldn't survive very long without clothes. Also, I live in a very small town with very few, if any, homeless people, so the theory wouldn't really make sense. It could also be some kind of animal that had found its way inside, but we got a good look at it, and it didn't resemble any animal I've seen before. I have no idea what that thing was. I am normally a rational, a cam's razor kind of person, but we saw what we saw, and I have no explanation for it. When I was 19, I worked as a stalker for Target and had to bike to work early every morning around 4 a.m. Worst job ever. One morning, I got on the bike and began pedaling the five miles like usual. After a while, I got the weirdest feeling. I could feel that something was following me. I can't explain it any better than that. It was like a sixth fence. But here's the kicker. I could feel that whatever was following me from the air behind me and up in the sky. My heartbeat quickened and I started pedaling faster. Movies were pouring through my head. Jeepers Creepers, Lost Boys, Interview with a Vampire. Any movie that has a scene in which something flies down and onto someone in, a vehicle. At this point I'm expecting my rational brain to kick in and do its. It's usual thing anytime I'm in a dark room or alone in an alley and relax me. It doesn't and the feeling gets progressively more powerful. I am now sure that something is following me and is getting closer. I can remember my vision almost seemed to blur as my hearing became more crisp. My body was shifting gears from one sensory preset to another. My back felt as sensitive as my palms. Finally, I get the balls to look behind me. Nothing there. I keep pedaling faster and faster and faster. I look behind me again. There is something there. I, I can't tell what it is. It's dark. A hundred feet up and following me. Now I start to shit in my pants. I can remember being incoherent almost as if my body had shut down all higher functioning and replaced it with robotic movement. I remember thinking of Discovery Channel shows where the gazelle runs from the line. And I know I'm the gazelle. I was simply waiting for whatever it was to land on me at this point. Me and my bike eventually burst into an empty but well-lit intersection and start heading down the hill to Target. The feeling lets up as suddenly as it seized me and I knew I was safe. I looked around me and up in the sky and everything was fine. Nothing there. 
I'm not sure what happened that morning 11 years ago, but as you can see, I remember almost every second of it. I was house-sitting for a friend in an ill-planned housing development out in the middle of nowhere. Everybody in the development had pooled their money and gone on a two-week cruise together. My friend didn't have cable yet, so I amused myself most nights by defending his refrigerator from a beer invasion. There was nobody for company but the one guy who had just moved in down the street and his great Dane-sized mixed-breed dog named Cujo, who hated me. Power went out one night, and we're standing in the road drinking the beer so it doesn't spoil. Any excuse, right? Talking about how spooky the place is only lit by moonlight when we hear a cougar. Two things you need to know about a cougar's roar. One, they sound exactly what you'd imagine a woman being tortured to death would sound like. And two, they sound like they're right behind you even if they're a mile away. Cujo's hackles rise and he starts growling, staring off into the distance. More roars. I explain to the guy that it's a cougar. It's miles away, but the sound carries. That's a mating cry, and not a hunting cry, and nothing for Cujo to be afraid of, etc. This one literally sounds like it's ten feet away. Cujo cuts his head around, ends his growl with a little squeak, and stares at a spot right behind me. Right behind me. I very slowly turn around. Nothing is there. The cougar screams happen again. One far away and one that I swear is coming from the shadow of the house I'm looking at. I turn to the guy to suggest that maybe we want to go inside now. The guy and the dog were gone. In a few seconds they'd gone far enough to be out of sight on a gravel road without making any sound whatsoever. More screams. This time it seemed like both were coming from the shadows of the houses around me. I'm sure I broke some kind of land speed record getting back to my friend's house. Then I broke another record closing and locking all the windows. For the next hour or so, which seemed like a week, I heard screams from different places around the neighborhood. My beer, soaked mine, decided the cougars were trying to figure out which house I was in. When the scream stopped, I was convinced that they'd found me and were closing in. I very quietly started looking for the guns I knew my friend owned, but had hidden very well because he had children in the house. Every time I tried to lie down to go to sleep, I remembered my grandfather's stories about how the reason why cougars sound like a woman screaming is because they really are women screaming. They're humans trapped in cougar form by magic and pissed the hell off about it. Then I'd get up and look for the gun some more. I finally drifted off around dawn. I didn't see Cujo or the guy for the rest of my stay, but it turned out they were okay because my friend later mentioned that his daughters liked inviting them over and riding Cujo like a horse. In January 2019, I noticed something lumbering down my driveway. The window I was looking out faces over and above the drive, if that's clear. For example, I can see the roof of your car, but not always the bottom of the tire. Regardless, I notice movement. I look out and see what I initially thought was a bear, nose to the ground, kind of snuffling its head side to side, casually walking down the drive on all fours. A little geographical clarity. I live in town. The front of my neighborhood faces a major highway, but the back is all state game lands. I've seen some wildlife, turkeys, a deer here and there, and every skunk in the county apparently lives on my street. I don't see many squirrels, groundhogs, or chipmunks, which is a bit odd. I'm not very far from the city of Scranton. Enjoy office fans. About seven miles from downtown, so I'm not exactly in the sticks. I watch this bear mosey down toward the street, its head lowered. I move from the living room window to my bedroom window that has a full view of the street. Sure enough, here it comes. But something is wrong. I watch this not bear stand on two legs and casually walk out into the road. I see pointed ears and a long snout. It's got its head raised, smelling the air. I felt pee run down my legs. This was no bear. 
I saw it in perfect silhouette under the yellow street light. It was either dark gray or black. The yellow light threw off the true color. It stood without effort, looked like one fluid movement. It then walked across the road, casual as you please, and kind of hunkered down in some scrub brush. I'm not sure what kind of brush, but it's like for Scythia, all tangled and thick. Then I realized it was looking right into my bedroom. It had blue eyes. I'm not sure if that was reflected light of they were glowing. It looked right at me. I lost my legs at that moment and sat down under my window, absolutely panicked. I was home alone with five cats and a dog who slept through the whole thing. I didn't know what to do. My window is a big picture window, and if it wanted me, it easily could have gotten me. I cautiously got on my knees to peek over the sill, and I lost it. Didn't see eyes or it anywhere. It seemed to be either moving away from the forest behind my house, or it decided to rest up in that scrub brush. What I saw under the streetlight is as follows. Darkish fur, high-pointed ears, long muzzle. I never saw teeth or if it had a tail. It had hands with long claws that hung kind of limp wrist. If they were fully extended, they would hang below the knee. It walked digitigrade on dog legs. It looked heavily muscled, but had a tapered waist. It was about seven feet tall, judging from where it stood in relation to the streetlight. It was non-aggressive even when I felt it look right at me. I was terrified, but I didn't get a sense that it was pissed off it had been seen, as some people report. I didn't take a picture because I simply didn't think to. I was in a fair amount of shock, and I'm sure I'll eat shit for this, but sometimes your phone is the absolute last thing on your mind. The next day, I called Vic of Dogman Encounters Radio. His advice was solid, and I try and remember it when I have to go out at night. There have been some odd sounds tapping at my window. I can hear scratching of the siding. I don't see that many animals around the neighborhood. There used to be about seven stray cats I fed. All gone. Once the weather broke, it's been quiet. I installed motion lights and bought two game cameras. I'm hoping they are in a sense like Sasquatch. They avoid game cams. I don't ever want to see this thing again. Those of you who want to see one, pray you never do. My encounter was non-aggressive. I can't imagine having to deal with this thing pissed off. I still can't sleep a full night, and every sound scares the hell out of me after dark. I live alone, and the point three hundred fifty-seven I own would probably just ruffle its fur. Thank you for taking the time to read this. It was a terrifying animal to see. I hope I never see it again, but sadly that wasn't in the cards. I'll post that story another time. I and my husband were driving down Cabbage Patch, a narrow gravel road near Pine Thicket, looking for deer when husband said, what is that? I looked and said, what the heck is that? I saw a large brown object slightly bent over as if to pick up something. It raised straight upon two legs, had long arms, broad shoulders, and stood about seven to eight foot tall, very hairy. About that time, it ran into the Pine Thicket with the speed of lighting. We were about twenty to thirty yards from it. We went back to the site the next morning, and we found a small footprint about eight inches long, and a big footprint about thirteen inches long in sight of where we seen it. We found some hair on a fence and metal poles that had been stepped on and bent over the fence was pulled up off the post and bottom fence all the way to the ground. We found a persimmon in the area that it was seen, and there was no persimmon tree nowhere around. The sightening was about 1.30 p.m. CST. It was about a one and a half a mile from my house. I grew up an only child in rural Pennsylvania. I used to sneak out of my bedroom and go hang out in our backyard on summer nights when I had trouble sleeping or woke up in the middle of the night. This was around ages 6, 8, mid-90s. I'd go sit just below the top of the backyard hill, where I was out of sight of our kitchen window. There were trees to the left with a wild open field across the rest of a mile-wide valley. We had a large hill with a bump in the middle that was perfect for sledding in the winter. Below that was a field with a deer trail cutting through the bottom of the hill, 
in a creek beyond at the center of the valley. On a clear night with a bright moon, you could see across the valley I grew up in about a mile to where my best friend's house had their floodlights on all night behind their house. And when I say rural, I mean very rural Pennsylvania. Parent-teacher conferences were scheduled the first day of hunting season, and kids would often be out for a couple of days just for that. We had two houses in eye line of our house from that backyard. It was more than 30 miles to our nearest Walmart. I also grew up very familiar with deer, bear, rabbits, and even saw a mountain lion once while hiking with family. All of this to say I am familiar with wildlife there. The first night I saw Dogman was like any other. I was chilling in the grass, thrilled to just be doing something my parents didn't know about. I saw something moving quickly down along the deer trail. It was dark black against the rest of the night, partway through its path from the woods beside my house. It noticed me and stopped. We just stared at each other for what felt like a long time. It stood up, and its ears were long enough to notice from a 100 yard or so distance. It was too thin to be a black bear, which I'd already seen a few times at that age. The staring continued for a long time. Eventually, it put its ears back down, put its front paws on the ground, and sprinted across the valley. I called it my werewolf because of the shape of it standing up. I don't think I ever told anybody. Like now, I loved having a secret. But after that first sighting, I went and sat outside a lot more. I remember once on a new moon I sat on the porch because I was too scared to go too far with how dark it was without the moon. I saw it three, four more times after that. It was usually running into the woods by my house, which were more than ten full acres owned just for hunting season. My werewolf never bothered me after that, but I remember I was really disappointed when it got cold outside, and I'd have to stop going out at night because I wouldn't see it. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.